principal sir can we begin the program yes. Unmute yourself. Hello. Ah, uh, it is already nine o'clock. Yes, sir. Yes, madam, please begin. Okay, sure, sir. Yeah. So, good morning, one and all, esteemed dignitaries, principal of our college, Professor Dr. S. V. Rathod, speakers at the plenary session, national and international delegates, and teaching fraternity from various colleges and university across the globe. On behalf. of bhavans hazari mal somani college of arts and science and jairam das patel college of commerce and management studies i mrs reena patel head department of psychology heartily welcome you all to the last day of the three day international conference on fundamental and applied sciences icfas 2021 organized by the faculty of science in collaboration with the internal quality assurance cell iqac May I now request Dr. Shantosh Desh Bhattar, Head Department of Zoology, to introduce the speaker for plenary talk eight, Dr. Edward Narayan from the University of Queensland, Australia. Over to you, sir. Uh, very good morning and a warm welcome to all the esteemed dignitaries, delegates, participants, research scholars, and student friends. I have the pleasure to invite today's guest speaker, Dr. Edward Narayan. senior lecturer school of agriculture and food sciences university of queensland australia dr narayan has obtained his phd degree in biology from the university of the south pacific and later he pursued his postdoc from the griffith university queensland under vice chancellor's fellowship program he is a gold medalist for the undergraduate bachelor of science degree course from the university of south pacific dr narayan's prolific career encompasses <coughs> encompasses in diversified realms of comparative vertebrate physiology reproductive and stress endocrinology conservation biology animal health and welfare dr edward has developed non invasive stress hormone monitoring tools for marsupials namely the koala woolly and the endangered greater bilby his studies also includes the health and welfare programs of tigers in australia and indian zoos stress hormone physiology and as well an innovative long term research program on the conservation physiology of wildlife dr edward has undertaken extensive post doctoral research fellowship training programs in internationally reputed and prestigious institutions spanning four countries namely new zealand australia canada and india he has supervised 40 students comprising of undergraduate honors masters and phd students in australia and overseas he has published over 80 research papers in collaboration with researchers in australia murdoch university university of melbourne dickin university macquarie university to name a few dr edward has an active ongoing international research collaborations in india argentina vietnam canada brazil the us and so on he further provides consultation support on animal welfare and other related works now dear participants without taking your additional time i request and call upon dr edward to enlighten us and deliver his plenary talk thank you over to you dr edward narayan sir thank you thank you very much uh, sir and um, greeting everybody here from uh, queensland in australia i am really honored to be given a chance to talk to you um and if my voice is not very clear i apologize in advance um so basically today i will be uh, taking you on a bit of a journey uh, with the uh, stress physiology um how we can you know better assess the health and welfare of uh, animals um so hopefully you will enjoy some of the findings that i will deliberate on today um let me just close my video so it's better 
Before I continue, um, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues, um, I, my students, my professors, um, my collaborators in India, um, at, um, Pune University, especially I visited there uh, a couple of times during my Australia India uh, fellowship exchange. Um, it's, it's a very great uh, place to be in and do research in. Um, so surely the journey is not uh, one person's, it's a, um, it's a um, helping hand in, in every way, especially for the young uh, people in the audience. Um, you want to make sure that uh, early on in your career, you start to look for opportunities and uh, pick up opportunities wherever it is because um, the field has become ever more challenging, um, especially zoology, um, we, at the moment, I'm supervising a master's student from um, a former school of Pune University, and um, I can um, see, you know, the struggle that students are going through. It's it's a, a very challenging, uh, uh, but the passion is very much uh, in everyone, which is really good. So the University of Queensland, I'll talk a bit about that. Um, we are one of Australia's leading research institution uh, in top five of uh, universities. Uh, it's number 36 in the world. Um, and I'm actually a part of the School of Agriculture and Food Sciences. Um, and within the school itself, we are number one in agriculture in Australia, food science and technology, and uh, we have a lot of students, uh, both uh, nationally as well as internationally. So um, a very strong program in international students. Um, and we want to continue to harness that. Um, we have uh, world-class facilities, uh, labs, field stations, uh, animals. Um, if you come on the campus uh, here where I am sitting, we have uh, you know, wild animals, insects. Um, we have all sorts of uh, facilities where students can do their research in. Our research areas are uh, mainly in, um, or study areas for students are um, in three main cohorts, um, sort of animal science, food science, agriculture, and dual degree. Uh, veterinary science is also very strong here. Um, so the research strengths range all the way from agribusiness, uh, because we know agriculture is very important, isn't it? Um, as part of, uh, humanity um, and feeding the planet. Um, wildlife science is also a major thing um, and environmental science likewise is really important. Uh, plant science, agronomy. Um, so it's all fitting in together to give you the, um, you know, the overall picture of how we can do research. So if anyone is interested, I'm sure you would be interested in knowing more. I'm more than happy to guide you. If you can send me an email or um, you can look up on our website. Um, so that's going, going to be good. Um, so just going straight to the talk, basically um, today I'm going to talk a bit about how we can assess the health and well-being of animals. We know the challenges we've put onto our planet is uh, overwhelming. And um, just hearing in the conversations about COVID-19 itself has really caused um, a lot of problems in our society. Um, and we are facing ever more challenges with regards to how um, humans, uh, you know, with our very own existence, um, we have caused a lot of problem to our planet already. So if this continues to happen, we will see um, ever more increasing global climate change. One of the things that's really uh, close to my heart is uh, understanding the welfare of animals. So finding out, you know, how we can assess the health and well-being of animals. Uh, from a scientific manner so that we can help um, zoo programs, um, you know, um, whichever animal, pet, pet animals, we have uh, rescue dogs, cats, uh, birds, all sorts of uh, animals. Um, and it's uh, here in Australia, we are sort of, hopefully there will be examples to get some knowledge from and share and exchange, you know, that's what this is all about. Um, it's trying to um, care for animals and it comes as a moral responsibility to make sure that our animals are um, feeling emotionally um, happy, which is a very challenging topic um, on its own. But on a, 
on a more broad spectrum, you can look at things like physical stress. Um, you can look for you know freedom against hunger, thirst, fatigueness, injury, extreme thermal environment, or psychological stress like fear, restraint. You know, this is known as the five freedom. So this came about from the RSPCA guidelines. Um, but now what's happening is we know that beyond um, just five freedoms, there are other things, um, you know, we have got things like microorganisms to be uh, really worried about because that can cause a lot of uh, zoonotic diseases as well as uh, imaging infections in animals, which can cause downstream effects on the animal's health and well-being how they are being looked after, the day length, temperature, all these things will actually affect the outcome of the animal's productivity. And in this case, um, I'm not just talking about, um, you know, uh, agriculture animals, but mainly wild animals, you know, we are, have a zoos in particular, <clears throat> we know that stereotypic behavior can be a bit of a problem. So how can we better understand the mental state of the animal? which is something that uh, is now starting to be researched more on. Uh, for example, if you look at the brain, you can look at brain mapping. Uh, you can look at stable um, RNAs, which can uh, be the index of pain, okay? Pain perception and things like that. So a lot of uh, effort is being put onto this part right now and um, more and more needs to be uh, done, I, I believe. So here in Australia, as you know, if some of you may have visited Australia already, you'd know like, you know, uh, sheep and cattle, that's a deep rooted part of our system. <clears throat> and basically um, making sure that the animals are given the right environment um, so that they don't uh, end up with some sort of an infection or a disease on the legs uh, and the animals just, you know, end up thinking that it's uh, stress. So the analogy is not just, um, within one animal, it's across animals. Uh, because when animals go through stress, they will stop behaving, uh, they will stop socializing, birds will stop singing, frogs will stop, uh, you know, calling. Um, you know, I remember going to Matheran with uh, Professor Narhari at the Pune University, and we did some research on the, um, the Bombay night frog, and, you know, they have uh, beautiful call structures and things like that. So if that uh, environment is disturbed, then you basically be seeing animals not performing their naturalistic behavior, which is where I am really interested in, in applying some of these physiological tools to assess uh, stress early on so that we can catch the problem early and hopefully reverse, as you will see as I continue my slides, we will try to first of all define what stress basically means. So last year, you know, and this year also, we are talking about on the TV every, every day you hear the word stress. Um, basically, it means that the environment is, is not uh, able to uh, be healthy enough for the animal to go on a day-to-day -day basis. So generally, animals are very uh, much aware, able to cope with their environment. So they have an acute response. It could be anything, it could be uh, increasing your heart rate, it could be, um, you know, um, <clears throat> your metabolic rate will be uh, altered. Um, and so essentially it will be uh, helping you to adapt to the situation. So it is not a bad thing. What I say is, if you have no stress, you should check your pulse. <laughs> okay, so stress is not a bad thing. So what is a bad stress then? The bad stress, is chronic stress. So basically what that means is now the animal, you can put any animal here. Okay, I put the sheep there because I'll, I study sheep. I'll talk about that with wool production. Um, but you can see that if there is chronic stress, then you'll have an alarm. So it could be anything like there is no food. Here in Australia, we have had huge periods of drought and that basically leads to downstream effects on the adaptation of the animal, eventually leading to exhaustion and the animal dies. So here in Australia, if you see uh, last year uh, and before last year, a lot of cattle, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, animals died. A lot of koalas died because of bushfire. We had massive bushfire. Last week, we had massive flood. 
one in 50 years, the flood that came in uh, New South Wales, one of our states in Southeast Queensland, it killed a lot of animals. A lot of people were affected. So, you know, chronic stress is very much existent in our planet right now with uh, our animals, um, obviously humans as well. <laughs> um, and so you can measure stress in many ways. Um, the, the good thing about humans is that we have got ways to overcome stress by socializing, uh, maybe a Zoom call with my family members uh, or a phone call with a friend, uh, but animals can't do that. So that is where you will see uh, in animals in particular, they will show cases of stereotypy. So if you go, for example, to a zoo, you will see that uh, the giraffe will lick the walls or the bear is um, pacing quite uh, rapidly uh, around. It's, it's uh, maybe uh, removing his hair. So that's an extreme case of stress, which is what we want to avoid. So we can avoid that by using some biomarkers, some physiological biomarkers that are user friendly, that can be used to be measured quickly enough. And we can tell, oh no, your animal is actually showing some stress. We can try to reduce that. So here in Australia, I've been uh, lucky enough to work with um, the farming industry. So my technology, obviously I have a PhD in uh, frog endocrinology. So, uh, you know, I was able to expand my ideas into other animals like uh, sheep and cattle and um, koalas and all sorts of animals, you know, crocodiles. Um, so this is one good example here. They were saying um, the um, journalists would used to come to me and say, Edward, with the sheep, tell me um, if a sheep is stressed. So a good example of chronic stress in a sheep is this larvae of blow fly. So the fly will actually be stuck on the uh, breech area of the animal. I apologize, some of these images may be a bit uh, of an ISO for some of you, <laughs> just close your eyes. Um, basically what happens is the fly will be stuck there for uh, at least 10 days. So this has been tested scientifically by researchers at the CSIRO, which is Australia's uh, leading uh, governmental science department. Um, so you can see here, you can uh, see elevation in plasma cortisol, uh, immunoglobin 6, which are secondary uh, biomarkers of immune function. So all these things are happening. But why am I then calling it chronic stress is because what's happening to the animal on the onset is that this particular fly also causes a loss in the body weight and also leads to the loss in the wool. So wool in Australia is a big commodity. It's, um, uh, it's really sorted after the superfine merino wool. Uh, they are being uh, bought here from Australia quite a lot. So when that happens, we need to overcome this stress. You can call the veterinarians and they will help you out. But if we were able to understand that stress early on, then it could have helped the animal. Another good example of chronic stress, well, it's not good for the animal, but here you can see this sheep is sloughing his skin. So basically this happens when he eats a grass during um, sort of autumn in uh, Australia, there is a period where the grass tends to collect some toxins in it. And when that grass con collects the toxin, it tends to lead to some uh, neurological effects as well as morphometric effects by causing the animal to slough, slough, slough its uh, skin. So basically when that happens, you can see our study was able to um, demonstrate by collecting uh, feces from the sheep and measuring cortisol in the feces. Now I'm measuring cortisol, not in the blood, but in the feces. And you can see a significant difference between animals that were subjected to this treatment versus control group. So it basically tells you that the technology is powerful enough using non-invasive stress hormone monitoring to actually detect uh, the levels of stress that the animal is going through. Because I don't know if you've collected blood from a sheep before, it is not an easy task. You have to be careful enough so that the blood doesn't undergo hemolysis. Um, and you have other techniques like salivary cortisol, which has been used in uh, chimpanzees. But in sheep, they tend to bite you as well. So you have to be careful which tech method you are actually hoping to use that can actually be useful for your animal. That is also important when developing research. 
A very good uh, example of chronic stress was also in uh, rhinos. So there was a big news story, a big group of rhinos in the US was introduced in a national park and uh, news reporters came, everyone was happy. Um, we have saved another endangered species. Six months later, they basically stopped cycling as in they did not show any estrus cycle and the testosterone levels were basically zero in the male animals. Why was that? What they saw was that the post-capture cortisol levels were all showing downward trend. So every time when we see something going upward, we think it's bad. So if we see things going downward, we think it's good because we, we look at things in two dimensions. But I think that's really dangerous. We need to look at things in three dimensions because here what's happening is you are showing in a wrong way that if the cortisol levels after capture are lower than the cortisol levels before capture, it doesn't mean that the animal is not stressed. It means that the animal is chronically stressed, which was a big eye opener and a very interesting example. Uh, one of the few rare examples of how failure of adaptation of animals to novel environments led to um, their failure of reproduction, which is why Nowadays, I really urge zoos to monitor the hormone biology of their animals. Uh, even if they can't do that, somehow monitor their stress cycle, uh, stress levels. You know, you can do that using behavioral indicators that should help you uh, because it's not an easy task to uh, cause an animal to breed. I tried breeding the endangered ground frogs. Uh, it took me a few years to actually uh, monitor that. This is a colony of uh, bears in a century in Vietnam, and uh, they are living a happy life. But this is not where their life started from. Their life basically started from here. They were in this cage, very much away from their friends, their family members, cubs being um, taken from the moms. Very sad story. So I worked with Animals Asia, and I was able to demonstrate by collecting their feces, Again, it sounds very simple, but you know these simple things have, are really powerful. So we were able to demonstrate that through time with the tendering love and care, that the carers are providing to these bears, their stress levels are slowly, slowly going down. Okay, so not all five fingers are the same. So not each bear will be able to integrate. It takes time and effort, but at least with this technology, we were able to showcase and Animals Asia was very proud of that result because it was a scientific evidence of their hard work was working, which then they can go and show to the government or to the policymakers and people with funding. So I will not go too in detail about how to measure stress. Uh, we have got workshops upcoming where students can uh, learn the technology. Um, uh, helping some students at uh, the Pune University um, and I'm happy to help students uh, wherever they have any questions about the technology. But basically when you have the activation of the HPA axis, the hormones are metabolized and they get preserved in the feces. Um, and you have a suite of hormones that you can quantify in animals. Uh, we have all uh, worked on that for a few years now. We published a lot of uh, interesting papers on uh, the suitability of assays in animals. So the technology is now being expanded into livestock. We are also tracking animals through time. So you must be wondering, you know, he's jumping from wild animals to livestock. The thing is you can work with different sectors. The technology is what I'm working on. My area is stress. And I, I want to show that stress is present in everything with a beating heart. And we can reverse it if we are able to detect it early. So some of our research, for example, in reproductive breeding biology of sheep, it's a big thing in Australia. And heat stress is a huge problem here in Australia because this is one of the hottest uh, countries in the world. <laughs> you can only uh, come and uh, live here for a while and you'll notice in the regional areas. So what happens is if animals are above 39.5 degrees, the rectal, uh, rectal temperature, their cortisol levels are very high and the embryos of the mother sheep is dropped. So she loses a lot of embryos because of heat stress. So is this because the 
of acute stress or chronic stress, we can monitor these things by working with the farmers to understand. And we can also come up with strategies. For example, in the shed, we can put some fan, some ventilation, some ice cubes to help the sheep uh, become cool before we subject it to some uh, other experiments. And one of the latest technology that my lab uh, was able to develop was to quantify these hormones in the wool. So you can see this wool sample is um, around uh, nine months old and every centimeter is one month of stress. So you can see this is a period where the farm was under extreme drought. Okay, so basically what we then did was we were able to demonstrate, this paper was accepted last week actually. So we were able to demonstrate that in the wool, you can actually measure the stress and use it to see whether the mother will give birth to a live lamb or not. Because if the mother is extremely stressed before parturition, then her lambs will basically have a huge risk of uh, uh, birthing problems. And we are doing research by tracking animals through the satellite. We have tags on, on the mother and each dot represents the individual shape, which we can uh, view from our um, desktop or our phone. And the farm is um, many, many, many kilometers away from here. And we can track the behavior, grazing behavior with regards to shearing. And I'm also doing a research to see whether the um, stress uh, genetics or epigenetics is actually transferred across generation from the mother to the daughter and then from the daughter to the granddaughter. Because I believe that the environment can have a huge uh, uh, say with regards to the genes that are being transferred to their uh, offspring. So I you know, continue a bit more, I guess I have 15 minutes, I believe. Um, I haven't had a good track of time, but I believe I have that. Um, we are doing research on koalas as well, which is one of Australia's native wildlife. You must have heard about this animal. <laughs> Everybody thinks that he's a cute, cuddly animal, but he's undergoing chronic stress. Last year, my work appeared in a lot of media attention because we were able to demonstrate that this animal is actually about to be extinct in the next less than 50 years time. And basically what's going to happen is he's facing stress, not just because of the uh, impact of the increasing human population in areas like Sydney or Brisbane, which is um, increasing more towards the West. So we are removing the land and he only eats this particular type of plants, which is eucalyptus and basically uh, losing um, a lot of habitat and he also has disease. So chlamydia is also there. So the stress physiology can be put into a context of captive breeding, um, you know, biological stress, invasive species. This is where I did my PhD. Like it was said in the introduction, I was on this island for three years looking for frogs. <laughs> okay, so I was on this island, uh, basically coming by boat, searching for the ground frogs and nobody had seen the eggs. So I was told, Edward, can you do this? Go to this, this forest and look for the frog's egg. This is your PhD project. I was lucky, uh, my, my professor was from, uh, uh, from India, uh, Professor Ketan Christie, he's a physiologist. That's his hand there. And uh, we, we were able to develop some methods to study the biology of the animals. And I discovered the eggs for the first time and successfully bred them. Um, and so that then took me to, uh, from Australia, then from Fiji to Australia, and the Australian government sent me to India. So that's where I met uh, Professor Graham Prohit from uh, Savitri Bhai Phule Pune University. Um, and we supervised Amruta Joshi, who's just completed a PhD. I'm supervising another student at the moment uh, with Professor Graham Prohit, is my good colleague uh, for many, many years now. And so we are using that technology to assess the reproductive biology of this rare and highly uh, cryptic and iconic species of India. So we can see that urinary testosterone levels, this is in urine. You don't want to collect blood from this small frog. It's very hard, he will die. So we can actually collect testosterone. And I was very proud of Amruta. She was in the forest by herself 
collecting the samples. I, I was just amazed about that. I used that in my examples with my, I have roughly you know, 10 PhD students here in Australia. We talked about the perseverance of these students is, is just amazing. Um, and so now we are you know, applying this technology across animals uh, in different animals. This is the bilby. It's a little red kind of animal, but it's also iconic. Here next week, they have the Easter celebrations. The bilby is used heavily. It's like a bunny. Uh, they have the Easter bunny because it was a big year. So with our technology, we used um, fecal cortisol to demonstrate that animals show stress. So there was a male who was being used for school visits, shows, but he was injured and then restrained. And then the vet did some general anesthesia. You can see the fecal cortisol is really over the roof. This guy over here is a control, is basically flat line. And this one here, no stress, is basically in the middle. So it basically tells you that if your animal is injured, please don't give him some time to recover because this could have downstream effects on his uh, reproductive health immune health and other things. And we've done research on um, some captive tigers as well to demonstrate um, how stress uh, varies across um, the interventions that's been given to animals. So some of them who are using really hands-on uh, methods, uh, their stress levels are higher. This doesn't mean that this these uh, tigers are more stressed. It's just telling you that that's what their capacity is at. So naturally, it could be that that's what is better for them because these are a top, top uh, state predator species. So he needs something like that. If he had a flat line, maybe that's not a good sign. That could be a sign of chronic stress, which is what I'm trying to explain to people here. And finally, I guess the Bilby study we did across um, sites in which we were able to see things like foxes, cats, dogs, they are a big predator species here in Australia, uh, feral animals, and they will kill a lot of native species. So we will bring them and put them in these uh, captive breeding facilities, and we will try to see what the stress levels are like. And we are also doing some projects to release animals back in the wild. So you need to be able to you know, prepare them so that they can uh, smell the cues of cats and dogs or foxes. So all these things are interesting projects uh, that's happening in Australia. This is Stephanie who just graduated, one of my PhD students. And uh, what my message would be to young sort of upcoming students is these big picture things like climate change and all that, it's a bit hard to decipher and untangle. So I think for us, at least we can study this sub little stuff. So things like proximate stresses, you can look at nutritional stress, capture and handling. So you can go to the zoo monitor these animals, uh, you can go to the farm or wherever you can monitor these animals, you can see what's happening with their transport. So little by little, you will be able to understand the picture of what this animal is going through. So for example, we studied this another endangered species in Australia, it's the uh, bush rat. And we found out that during winter, he was really stressed. So we uh, then Stephanie told the zookeepers in winter, don't uh, handle them too much because they become really stressed. And then you can relate the stress physiology to uh, parasites. So you can collaborate. A parasitologist can collaborate with a physiologist. Um, and the overall picture on chronic stress, I believe people still think that koalas um, do not show stress. But you know, I'm sitting here in my office. I've got a brain of a koala in a little jar uh, next to my table. And we already know that they are chronically stressed. So they will become blind. You'll go on the road, you will see a dead animal. People are driving like, uh, you know, stupid. And basically this will cause chronic stress. Um, and that puts a lot of pressure on everybody. You know, the zoo, keep, the rescuers, the government, everyone is because people are not following the simple rules. So it was in uh, the media as well, how much stress can a koala bear? Uh, we have demonstrated that male koalas become very aggressive if you try to handle them. Uh, but females are happy to, you know, um, because they, this is funny, because we come to the zoo, you will get a koala to take a photo with it. So you as a tourist would have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. Some of the animals are really stressed if you, <laughs> if you try to touch them, and especially the females who are having a little baby. 
Okay, so we try to say that if animals are having, you know, little babies don't go near to them, they will become really stressed. And males can be really aggressive, but you know, the, the female animals, they are more cooperative, they are, you know, understanding, but males are more aggressive. Um, so I also appeared on the news and they talked about our research here in Australia. This is what the brain of a koala looks like. Okay, so you can see the brain in the spinal cord. And this is basically the adrenal gland, which is the main uh, tissue where the stress hormones would be released. But you can see this was 15 years ago, you would uh, cut up the animal and see that hyperplasia of the uh, adrenal gland has happened already. So now we have technology to measure hormones, not just in feces, but in hair as well. So we published the paper last year where we demonstrated fully the method to quantify cortisol in the hair of animals. So now people are sending me hair from all over the country uh, and I can quantify hair cortisol for them. So from a frog going all the way to koalas and sheep and cattle. So now you, hopefully that gives you a bit of a picture on where you can take your ideas and develop it. So we have got a range of projects um, and I definitely believe that humans and animals will have always been and will always be together side by side, but it's our moral responsibility to help animals. And uh, with science and scientific innovation, we can actually guide uh, the uh, people who are working with animals like zookeepers. So um, you can follow my research on uh, ResearchGate as well. Um, and um, you can also look at a special issue I had last year in Animals Journal. It is one of the nice journals. Uh, and I have a collection of papers in there. Um, and if anyone is interested in publishing a paper with us this year, we have a special issue uh, in BMC Zoology. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank uh, um, everybody, my research sponsors. And uh, I would also like to thank um, the conference organizers for giving me an opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for a very insightful and informative session explaining the different parameters of measuring stress in animals and thereby promoting welfare of animals by addressing the stress issues in them. Thank you very much, sir, once again. I now Thank request you. I now request uh, Mr. Sopnil Shivari, co-convener, to moderate the question and answer session, followed by the vote of thanks. Over to you, Sopnil, sir. Thank you, Reena, madam. Thank you very much, uh, Edward, sir, for such a wonderful uh, talk in such a short uh, amount of time you have provided most of the uh, description of all the animals of Australia and methods for reducing the chronic stress right from uh, sheep, goats, koalas, rhinos, frogs, tigers, foxes and kangaroos. So in a very short uh, uh, time you have discussed a lot of uh, things sir. So we are having certain uh, questions from the uh, participants. Uh, so the first one is, uh, what is the approximate duration of an animal, for example, sheep, to overcome chronic stress? That is a very nice question. Thank you for asking that. Um, so cr chronic stress is, it's a spectrum. Okay, so stress is a spectrum. It has no start, it has no end. So stress is generated in our womb uh, when we are developing at the DNA level. So the important thing to know here is that when the animal is going through chronic stress, which means prolonged burden of stress, that means that he already in some physical signs, like uh, he may have an infection, he may be losing body weight. So that is a very severe case of uh, stress, which is what I'm trying to avoid uh, from happening. Because by that time, even the veterinarians will find it very hard to uh, recover the animal. So it could take uh, weeks, especially with, for example, blows fly larvae, the one which I showed in my uh, slide, that can take uh, weeks uh, to resolve. And we also have drench resistance. So some of the parasites have become very clever. So the animals are actually not able to overcome these infections because the antibiotics are not working. So um, hopefully that answers the question. Yes, sir. So we have a next question. Uh, what methodology is used to measure stress hormones, uh, cortisol level from wool of sheep, hair of koalas, 
as the amount of cortisol might be in micro or nanoliters? Uh, we are using enzyme immunoassays for our methods because it's uh, very um, user-friendly. Uh, you can do the assay within a day. So enzyme immunoassays are quite uh, useful. Yes, sir. So it is, it is the uh, enzyme immunoassay immuno for the invasive technique. So, or else we can also use radio immunoassay for uh, if you take the blood of the animal. Yeah, you can use radio immunoassays and, and I stopped using radio immunoassays a few years ago because I had to take this radioactive isotope with me from one lab to another. And then they had to screen me if I had the isotope in my, in my, in my clothes. So it's a very cumbersome uh, technique. Uh, radio immunoassay takes a lot of steps. So with enzyme immunoassay, you actually overcome some of these steps but the reproducibility and the uh, high throughputness is still maintained. So when you are trying to establish a assay, like a minimally invasive assay for any animal, for example, we have a project uh, with the uh, autonomous uh, college in uh, Kerala. The, um, that one is looking at the fishing cats. So for that, you need to actually develop some baseline assays to establish what the levels would be like you can actually inject ICTH in the animal, or if the animal has some disease, you can show that he has some levels of stress in it um, before, you, before you just go and collect and, and, and just measure something and you believe in something. Because that is very dangerous. Uh, the smallest amount of sample we work with is like a few micro, like you said. So we have to be very, very, very careful with uh, how we measure these things. Yes, sir. So we have a next question. Yes, uh, please. Eucalyptus leaves have uh, uh, menthol-like properties. So does it have a cooling sensation and saves the koala from high temperature or drought in Australia? Yeah, no, that's a nice question. Yes, actually. Yes, sir. Yeah, it, it could possibly have something like that, but the koalas have their own cooling down uh, properties. If you look at the koalas in Queensland, so that's the upper side of Australia, they are actually having a thinner coat. So they don't uh, have a thick body as opposed to the koalas in uh, uh, South Australia, in Adelaide, it's like lower cooler regions. They are big koalas with big thick, thick fur on them. Like uh, they, they also hug the tree. So this was an interesting research uh, some of my colleagues did. They also hug the tree uh, to help in the evaporative cooling. And they also, so it's mainly behavioral um, with regards to accessing these large trees. These trees are, you know, 100 meters tall and they can climb the tree in like less than a minute. They're very quick. <laughs> so <laughs> you, yeah, so um, it's mainly behavioral, um, but eucalyptus is their favorite food. They can't live without it. Yes, sir. And we have a last question, sir. So, yeah, uh, sorry, Swapani. They are also eating uh, Kapoor. You know Kapoor, Kempho? Yes, sir. Uh, they are also eating that now. So Kempho, I don't know where it was, it came to Australia. And uh, koalas are also eating that, but it gives them um, uh, gut, some uh, stomach problems. Yes, sir. So the eating yeah. of uh, camphor and eucalyptus, uh, means it might be a natural adaptation to overcome uh, uh, the stress, to overcome the drought stress. Might be. Could be. I don't, I don't think anyone has studied that. Yes, sir. And the last question, and uh, that's the question from my side, sir. Uh, yes. Sir, uh, can, the, uh, can we inject uh, neurohormones in the, uh, uh, in the animals to reduce stress? As there are a lot of studies, uh, uh, the neurohormones are overcoming a lot of stress. So central injections of this neuropeptides, can it uh, reduce uh, stress in animals, in the animals which are in wild? So can it be reduced? Uh, so one of the biggest challenges, uh, Swapanil, it's a nice question uh, from a theory perspective, but uh, it is very challenging, especially with our animals. Uh, the Australian kangaroo, for example, it has this thing where you go and capture it, it will undergo capture myopathy. 
so basically it will the whole body will start to shake um, when it actually um, you know has to be captured so we it's very hard to perform these interventions we need to start from the basics um, maybe with some captive animals uh, to trial it and see if it works but most of the techniques right now it's more uh, I think we have passed that stage where we can do these interventions. The landscape is really changing drastically. So it's more about macro scale. Uh, well, uh, we are planting a lot of trees, but also more action needs to happen top down, um, you know, policies around, how, you know, what's the IUCN st st status of the koala. We don't even know that. Uh, how many koalas are there left in the world? Nobody knows the exact number. So there's big problems at the moment. Yes, sir. the introduction of these neurohormones, neuropeptides in the brain uh, can be done on uh, small animals like uh, amphibians, neurons. So in that, uh, it, it is possible and we can uh, study. Means the only the peptides which can uh, cross the uh, blood brain barrier. So that can be studied. Those peptides can be studied, sir. Yeah, definitely they can be, but they are not. They are not. They are not possible in such a short context. Uh, it would take you ages. To, to take it to that stage where it becomes widely available in the in the you know in the stream of things so yeah. i think the koala is in such a state where more needs to be done with regards to its environment yes sir. i uh, it is indeed my honor to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of bhavan sazarimal somani college of arts and science and jayramdas patel college of commerce and management studies I, Swapnil Shivale, extend my heartful, heartfelt gratitude to all those who made this session a remarkable event. I am very grateful to Dr. Edward Narayan for, for accepting our invitation to be the resource person of this plenary session and also delivering a comprehensive and lucid talk on minimally invasive evaluation of stress hormones in mammals in the field biology and zoological programs. We are truly overwhelmed with your active participation and look forward to a fruitful association in the future as well. Thank you all. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Sapnil, and congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Shivali. We now move on to the plenary talk nine. May I now request Dr. Suresh Gajbiye, organizing secretary, to introduce the speaker for plenary talk, Dr. Nishikant Vase, from the University of Virginia, USA. Thank you, Rina, madam. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. Nishikant Vase, senior scientist, biomolecular analysis facility, School of Medicine, University of Virginia, USA. Dr. Vase is currently working as senior scientist at a School of Medicine, University of Virginia. He worked as a postdoctorate researcher at Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources, Department of Biochemistry, University of Nebraska. He has completed his PhD in Chemical and Biological Engineering from University of Sheffield, United Kingdom. He, his research interests are metabolomics, protomics, mass spectrometry, and plant metabolomics. He analyzed the metabolomes of brain, liver, and body fluid of HIV positive cannabinoids user. He also has screened 1,700 compounds from the National Cancer Institute and identified brephelin A as lipid indicator. He has more than 25 publications and one patent to his credit. Dr. Vase is recipient of national and international award and fellowship. He is the member of Institution of Chemical Engineering. He had chaired postdoctorate travel grant award committee, postdoctorate advisory council, University of Nebraska Lincoln. With this uh, brief introduction, I would like to invite Dr. Nishikant Vase for his plenary talk on chemical genetic screening approach to study biology in microalga. Over to you, Nishikant sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Surat Gajbe, sir. Thank you very much for this nice and kind introduction. Uh, 
so I'll talk a little bit about myself and uh, then we can start with the talk. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I am from Maharashtra, uh, specifically Varda district. Uh, I did my uh, undergraduation and, and PG from Nagpur University. And then subsequently, I went to Sheffield University to do my PhD. And during my PhD, I was mostly working uh, to understand the effect of UV radiation on the, on the metabolism of a cyanobacteria called Nostoc punctiformi. So that's what I did for my PhD. And after my PhD, I, I went to uh, US, I came to US uh, for my postdoc. And for several years, I work on algal biofuels. Uh, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and during that algal biofuel work, we uh, generated and, and we use a very interesting approach, which is kind of a drug discovery approach to study biology in, in, in microalgae. Uh, so this is what I will focus uh, for today's talk. But apart from that, uh, because of my, my background in mass spectrometry, uh, so I have work on several projects uh, uh, spanning uh, studying a, a, a Zambian cohort, cohort from Zambia, which uh, where the people are HIV positive and, and they take uh, cannabinoids uh, to elevate their pain. And, and there are several other projects like recently after we had COVID infection and uh, the, the University of Virginia uh, uh, School of Medicine, they want, they, they said that oh, we want to study the effect of those COVID uh, infection on, uh, on, the, on the metabolites of those patients. So, so then we screened and, and studied uh, plasma samples of more than 300 patients where around 70 patients were COVID, severe COVID positive. And we, we had several interesting findings. Uh, and we are still, uh, right now, we are trying to finish off that manuscript. And when it is on, then I can talk about it. Apart from that, uh, a recently very interesting study I have done where uh, a PI, they, they approached me to study because they found a new source of insulin in eye. Okay. And they want to do some metabolite analysis on the retina of the eye and the retina pigmented epithelium of the eye. Uh, so if, even that study is still in the pipeline. So with this short background, uh, I would like to start with my today's talk. So the today's talk is, is basically about, I'll give a small background on chemical genetics or high throughput screening. And uh, I'll talk about how we can do about how we can stepwise do a, a chemical genetics experiment and, and what are the other things which we have to consider, what are the things which we have to uh, keep in mind while doing our, uh, this kind of research and so on and so forth. And, and I'll try to share some interesting results which we found. Okay. Just a moment, I'm just trying to find my laser pointer. Okay. So the use of small molecule to, to disturb the metabolism has a very rich history. And as we know, uh, like most of us have heard about a use of willow bark, uh, bark of the willow plant uh, for relieving pain. And it has been known since ages. And, and, and later on, that particular compound, which was found in the bark of that willow, is printed as aspirin by bears. There's another plant called cinchona, uh, which produces a compound, chemical compound called quinine, uh, which is used for treatment of malaria. Whereas penicillin is used as an antibiotic for several diseases. And there are several examples in medicine various herbicides and fungicides and, and all their origin 
can be traced back to plants and, and there are some specialized metabolites, some specialized chemicals which are found in, the, in those plants. And that's what are used for as a drug or as uh, other substances. So to give it a classical or, or a simple definition, so what is chemical genomics or chemical genetics? So it can be defined as a use of small synthetic molecule or sometime it could be natural molecule as well to perturb the metabolism to obtain a specific phenotype. Uh, the benefit of using this approach is that uh, they rapidly penetrate inside the cell uh, because of their curious or, or unique structure of each chemical, they have very specific substrate. Okay, and using them, you can create a loss of function or you can create a gain of function. And normally because these are just chemicals, uh, say for example, if you want to do any transformation or, or manipulate any organism, except for few plants or animals like E. coli or yeast or, or um, some mammalian cell, cell lines, some microalgae, some fungus, or maybe Arabidopsis, maize, ex except apart from these few examples, all other plants are very difficult to manipulate genetically, but they can be easily manipulated using a chemical. So that's, that's why chemical genetics is a unique and a very interesting tool to, to study met metabolism, to study biology. So basically there are two types of screens. One is a targeted screen where we try to identify a compound that target a specific protein or gene product. And, and second is something called a black box screen where we can involve a cell-based phenotypic screen where we have to identify a compound that influences a specific pathway or metabolic process. Okay, so I'll give in context of, of uh, uh, as an example. So since 2011, when I started doing my PhD, so I started working on my uh, microalgae and we were trying to study lipid metabolism because that time uh, those petrol prices were very high. Uh, the crude oil was around $140 per barrel. And, and that's why government all over the world, they, they were trying to find an alternative source of energy. They were trying to find an alternative source of energy. And that's where uh, they found that these microalgae have a huge potential to, to make more lipids. Because, you know, even the microalgae are very small, but, and, and normally they don't have a lot of lipids. But whenever we stress this algae for nitrogen, like say, for example, if you remove uh, nitrogen from their diet or from their medium, they get stressed and when they get stressed, they accumulate a lot of neutral lipids, which is what we generally use in our, uh, in our cars, in our uh, bikes, in our, uh, as a source of petroleum. Because these, those, so the petroleum which we use are nothing but uh, unsaturated neutral lipids. So people have started working and, and trying, to, trying to find a, a way to produce more lipids. And to do that, the only method they know is to starve those algae for nitrogen. But the problem is that since nitrogen is a um, kind of a essential element, it's very difficult because once you remove that essential element from the diet, uh, those algae will be very hugely stressed and they'll stop growing. When they stop growing, there won't be a lot of lipids. So after studying uh, those nitrogen starvation for one or two years, and uh, then we thought, well, this is not going anywhere. So we have to find a different way of treating this problem. And, and during my PhD, I took a course in chemoinformatics. So I had a little bit of idea uh, 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 
of of how drug discovery was done and and one fine morning while talking to my boss for a cup of coffee i said well how how about we try this way that we might try to identify some molecules which will induce the metabolism of microalgae without make starving it for nitrogen to make more lipids although it was a very wild idea but she jumped on it she said well looks like this is a very interesting idea let's try it okay so that's how that's what i'm going to talk about in today's talk so basically if we compare this chemical genetics to to classical genetics uh, there are several um, similarities and differences between them and the similarities are there are there is something called a forward genetics where we will have a phenotype uh, we use mutagenesis either it could be chemical mutagenesis or or uv mutagenesis okay and then we select the phenotype based on certain criteria or certain characters and we take the altered phenotype and then we try to identify what gene was changed to give an example say for example if you have heard about mutation breeding in 70s 80s or even now a lot of agricultural people do the mutation breeding so what they do they take a, a crop plant uh, they irrigate their seeds with either chemicals such as ethyl methyl uh, uh, chloride or or they use radiation like gamma radiation and then they sow the tree, uh, seeds in in field and finally they try to find a a trait or character which is beneficial as a crop okay and when they find it then they they start use that plant as a uh, as a parent and then start the progeny and in that process you we also try to find what gene was or what protein was changed or what gene was affected by that radiation or chemical mutagenesis treatment so that approach is a forward genetics in the same way we have something called as forward chemical genetics where we take a normal cell and then we screen that normal cell against a huge library of small compounds to find a compound which provide or which shows the altered phenotype okay and then we try to identify what protein it was binding so that we can understand uh, its physiology and and how it works then there is another way of doing it in genetics is something called as reverse genetic genetics so which is which is like a class uh, uh, a new type of uh, studies which is done in crop plant these days that is you take a, a, a sequence of dna you do a mutation on it and then you try to find the uh, altered phenotype either either uh, on the gene you can either do a gene deletion or gene insertion or or, or expression and these days people have started using not even deletion they have started using a, a very fine tuning of gene expression using either rnai or or crispr okay in the same uh, situation we can also use chemicals where you can you can uh, you have to find chemicals which will bind to it a protein and it can block its function so that we'll get the desired altered phenotype so those are the approaches uh, and uh, similarities differences between classical genetics and and chemical genetics so to do the chemical genetics the first thing we have to do is to design and and conceptualize a high throughput screening experiment just like a drug discovery what you might have heard about what pharmaceutical companies do so they do huge drug discoveries and based on that discovery that's how you get new drugs in the market and that's how uh, uh the the people find drugs for uh, new diseases but doing a drug discovery is a very long and laborious process it takes years and years of work it takes 
millions of dollars worth of money and and human labor cost to find only one or two drugs as a, as a potential drug candidate so this is why it's a long process and i'll try to explain what to do but i'm going to explain this in context of microalgae and and we'll see how it goes okay so the first thing we have to do in any high throughput screening experiment or, or is to find the phenotype or identify the phenotype okay and once you identify the phenotype then you have to develop an assay where you can clearly define what is positive control and what is negative control that means a positive control is is one which we want a negative control is, is what is as a baseline and since these high throughput screening has to be done on a micro plate so we have to optimize those assay in a very small scale so that's why we have to do assay optimization the next thing we have to do is that select a library because since we are we are doing this kind of screening we have to define what kind of chemicals we want to screen against uh, whether it they should be natural product whether they should be synthetic compound whether they should be um, a series of compound which are derivative of each other or whether there should be a diverse set of compounds so that's we have to decide we also have to consider that those compound should not be toxic to your animal where you are testing okay so these are certain parameters like their molecular weight should be less than 500 dalton their lock p should be less than 5 they should be uh, less than 5 hydrogen bond donors bond hydrogen bond donors in that molecule there should be less than 10 hydrogen bond acceptor and 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 there is a scientist called lipinski he gave five rules so the, they should any compound which you want to consider as a drug should um obey this lipinski rule of 5 once you define all these things and then you do your screening then you, the main prop, uh, the main thing to do is to identify your hit and there are different methods of doing it uh, there are most statistical uh, methods like qc using uh, qc z square uh, z score uh, identification or you can use a simple percent inhibition activation cut off or you you can use other um, statistical methods as average plus three times standard deviation and so on and so forth once you are and after the primary screen once you identify some set of molecules as a hit then we have to confirm it whether they are really hit or not okay and then say for example in an experiment if you find more than 100 or 200 molecules that doesn't mean that you have you, you have to test all of them then that's where uh, these new techniques of informatics and and structural similarity come into picture where you do hierarchical clustering and then try to compare each molecule with others and try to find out how similar they are and based on that then we have to decide what molecule to take it to the next level once we do that then the main main part of that uh, experiment is to try to find the ident identify the target in that uh, organism in question okay and uh, for that uh, we can use pull down assays we can use uh, a technique called as darts or or we can use another technique called as sexa which i'm going to talk about and finally you can use different techniques uh, and my favorite techniques are these techniques because these are multiple omics techniques and and using one or two experiment you can learn so much you can get so much information from that one experiment so that's uh, my favorite techniques and and that's how they are here okay so this is what we have to do means this is what it means to be uh, doing an assay optimization to say for example if i am say for example if i am trying to identify a k 
chemical compound which can induce that microalgae to produce more lipids, which means then I have to optimize an assay where I can identify, clearly identify uh, any microalgae which produce more lipids. Okay, and to, and to do that, what we do is to um, stain them with a lipophilic dye called Nile Red. So here you can see he, uh, the bars which shows N minus are the algae which are grown without nitrogen, whereas N plus is the algae which are grown with nitrogen. So you can see here within 24, 48 hours, the cells which are with, grown without nitrogen show huge amount of lipid accumulation as compared to the control algae. So in this experiment, it was we are just trying to optimize uh, our experimental condition. Like, should we use shaking? Should we use not shaking? Should we use room temperature? Should we use 37 degrees? And even we are trying to identify, should we use our Nile red stain at, at some specific concentration or should we dilute it down? Something like that. And normally, whenever we use do any drug treatment, we have to use a vehicle. And, and invariably, we use DMSO as a vehicle. So we have to also optimize how much DMSO we can add into the assay. OK, so that's what it was done here. And the other thing which we have to do is that how long you have to stain that, uh, um, uh, how long you have to use the staining protocol. So all those things has been optimized. This is what it is. So, and for compound screen, there are several sources of compounds. Like uh, uh, this is a, a private company called Charles River Compound Screening Library. And there is a Cambridge Corporation Screening Library. It's a huge amount of compounds. Uh, for university, from the University of Cambridge, they have a Milner Therapeutic Institute and there's a library from there. And the University of California, Riverside, they have the uh, uh, Latka Library. And there is a huge chemical uh, genomics program in Broad Institute, National Cancer Institute, CDRI Lucknow, Pacific Library, and so on and so forth. There are so there are so many sources of chemicals which we you can use for uh, drug discovery and this kind of chemical screening experiments. So this was my simple experimental setup. So you grow a microalgae called as Clematomonas, okay. And, and then you put those microalgae, maybe 200 microliter in, in this plate, and then each well in this plate will receive a specific compound from the National Cancer Library. It has 1700, more than 1700 compounds. Okay. And then what we were looking for is, because these cells were not starved for nitrogen, they will get the full uh, uh, nutrient, which means that normally they don't make more lipid. So what we were looking here is that can any compound, when the algae, when the cells were not starved for nitrogen, can it make more lipids? Okay. So from the primary screen, we identified eight compounds. You can see here, this was like a cutoff and, and, and these eight compounds can make at least more than five fold lipids in that assay. So we identified those eight compounds and then we did a confirmatory screen uh, using multiple experiments. And we found that out of these eight compounds, uh, naturally seven didn't work at all. So you can see here, there are like seven compounds. This is the eighth compound called BFA or brefeldine. And this is the nitrogen minus, nitrogen starvation. You can see here, the brefeldine can accumulate as much liquid as nitrogen starved cells. So once we identified that one compound, then we perform another biochemical experiment, such as uh, we assess their growth, we assess their complex lipid uh, 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 accumulation, we assess for pigments, tag biosynthesis, carbohydrate accumulation, and so on and so forth. Okay. So the first thing we did is we try to grow them uh, using a different concentration of that BFA compound. And what we found that even at the lowest concentration, uh, this 
this drug actually almost arrest the growth okay then we perform an uh, a dose response curve on the and we found that it has a, a decent uh, ec50 value of 2.5 and then we perform a lipid profile on them to identify that which lipid species was increased and we found that uh, the 160 uh, it's a uh, unsaturated uh, uh, 16 carbon lipid molecule which was increased and and this lipid molecule is also important because it's a neutral lipid and this also important component of your normal petrol and and that's what we want but the major worrying problem for us is that it stop the growth this is what we don't want we want we want that algae to grow continuously while we add keep on adding that compound and it should make more lipid so that was our idea and you can see here this is a fluorescent imaging picture uh, this is a control cells you can see you can barely see any red dots in there but when they are treated with uh, nile red uh, when treated with this bfa 5 micromolar you can see bright red dot these are the lipid droplets present inside the cells okay and normally you can also see that it doesn't destroy the chloro chlorophyll completely and this is a tlc analysis of those uh, neutral lipids and these are this is a triolene which is a yes, internal standard or a standard lipid standard neutral lipid and you can see here uh, this is n plus where there is very low small amount of neutral lipid present there but as we increase the concentration of this brefeldine you can see there is huge increase in the lipid accumulation there and the whole neutral lipid or the tag biosynthesis is governed by uh, or by an enzyme called as dgat which is acyl co diacyl glycerol acyl transferase and this is a rate limiting enzyme for neutral lipid production so by <clears throat> by treating those cells with bfa we found we showed that uh, it also increases the expression of dgat which which is which also increase in the positive control which is cells treated with nitrogen starved uh, nitrogen starved cells but because this particular experiment in this particular experiment we identified that it arrest the growth so we thought this still although we found that molecule but it still do not good enough we have to find something more we have to probe a little bit higher so but as a approach this approach worked so what we did we increase our collection of molecules and and we did another screen which was a large scale screen where we screen more than 48000 compounds 48000 compounds to identify small molecules which can induce those microalgae to produce more lipids <clears throat> so this is how we have uh, i have done this you can see here in a 96 well plate i will keep reserve one column for positive control uh, cells that means cells which are grown without nitrogen uh, one row will be for negative control wells where the cells are grown normally and within all the remaining wells of that plate it will receive normal cells plus a single compound or drug for a treatment <clears throat> and we did this for 48000 compounds and this is the primary uh, screen data you can see here there are several compounds uh, this is the primary screen growth data so we show that there are several compounds which arrest the growth completely but there are several compounds uh, which maintain the growth while in some cases it also increase the growth slightly Uh, we use G score to measure the uh, assay quality, and 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 we use uh, 0.5 as a uh, cutoff to say your assay is good quality. And you can see here most of the assay was more than 0.5. And finally, we found that there are more than 242 compounds we identified through the screen, which can make the algae to make more lipids. once we identified those compounds then we took those compounds 
and perform a dose response curves on all 242 compounds. So it was a eight point dose response curve. That means we have eight different concentrations from 0.25 to 30 micromolar. And this is a plot which shows that as we increase the concentration of those compounds, the lipid accumulation goes on increasing. And finally, because the amount of comp uh, uh, molecules we have was huge, so we still have to identify, we try, we have to identify whether there are certain classes of compounds which are common and, and maybe within that particular class of compound, then we have to identify which any, a, a compound or a drug which has the highest activity and take, take that rather than uh, taking all of them. So just to show that, you can see here, all these compounds are uh, clustered based on their structural similarity. And if I zoom in around this area, uh, which is magnified here, you can see that all these compounds, they have a similar structural uh, uh, moiety, like, like this benzene ring, and this is a uh, piperazin ring, okay? This benzene ring, this piperazin ring, benzene ring, piperazin ring, benzene ring, piperazin ring. So these are the common features among all those compounds. So that's what we were looking for. This is another approach where we were performing and, and this, this was another class of compounds, which is called as Edmonton ring. This, this complex chair-like structure is called Edmonton ring. So we, we found that out of all those molecules which shows positive identification, most of them have, uh, or some set of molecule have this kind of common structure. So final outcome for our screen was that uh, we screen more than 43, uh, uh, 40, uh, 44, 45,000 compounds. And finally, we came up with five structural groups. Okay. And we come up with only 15 molecules, which we, we thought that were interesting from 43,000. So we took all those 43,000 compounds and then we did a, a minimal dosage and we tried to find does they block the growth completely? We found that not really. Most of them, uh, although they have a little bit of stress, but most of the cells, most of the time cells do grow happily. The other uh, parameter we identified in the Breffelden study was that whenever we treat these cells with uh, any drug-like molecule or even in natural starvation, it increase the protein turnover and it degrade the proteins. But in this case, you can see here, almost all the 15 compounds maintain their protein content, which means that uh, they were not as uh, delete, uh, or, or bad to the cells as we thought. Okay, the another other parameter was that to look for starch accumulation because starch and, and lipids are reserve food material. And that's what um, these algae cells do is that when they are starved, they accumulate a lot of starch and they accumulate a lot of lipids. And, and people have also shown some relationship that if we block the starch accumulation, you can get more lipids. Okay. So in this case, we saw a similar kind of pattern where there are certain compounds which increase the starch content hugely. Whereas there are some compounds which decrease the starch content completely. So which means that this, this could be an interesting candidate to take it for the, uh, for the studies. And then if you look at, because, in, because this is a photosynthetic organism, so it has to maintain the chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B and carotenoid pigments. If it, if it can't maintain, it can't be healthy. And you can see here in most of the cases, these are the control and these are all treated cells. And you can see here, except for maybe one or two, most of them were maintaining their chlorophyll content, A, B, and total carotenoid, which means that they are not that much uh, toxic to those cells. So finally, we finally uh, we decided on these five compounds based on different criteria uh, uh, we have decided. And then we finally did a second dose response curve and to identify 
a minimal concentration of that drug that will induce a maximal uh, lipid accumulation. So you can see here, this is a healthy cell growing in full nitrogen. Uh, cells are very healthy. It looks very green, this culture. And you can see, but it can, it do not make any lipid or very small amount of lipid because you don't see any red dots in there. Whereas if you starve these cells for nitrogen, so you can see here, they make a lot of lipid, but but if you notice here, the pale uh, dark green color of that culture became very pale green, which means it's a chlorotic cells, which means they are losing chlorophyll. And when they are losing chlorophyll, which means that they will stop growing, okay? But when we look at all other compound treated cells, they all are maintaining their growth and their color. And not only that, they are also accumulating huge amount of lipid, as you can see here, uh, as a red dot. Again, uh, this growth was done um, at a concentration that we have decided after the dose response curve. And you can see that even at that lower dose response curve, they show excellent growth and they show excellent lipid accumulation capacity. The next part uh, uh, in in this analysis or to identify and to understand how the metabolism is responding to this drug is to do multi-omics experiment. Uh, we recently published this study in plant physiology. So this was a multi-omics study where uh, from the same cultures, we extracted metabolites, we extracted RNA, we extracted proteins, and then we did three different experiments. One is uh, uh, using from the RNA, we did uh, uh, transcriptome analysis, uh, we sequence, uh, uh, we convert the, uh, the mRNA to uh, cDNA and then uh, measure the transcriptome and did the pathway analysis. The second part is to extract the proteins from those cells. We did reduction, alkylation, and triptych digestion. And then we did a, a data and independent analysis to understand the changes in the protein expression based on these chemical treatments. And the third thing I have, uh, we have done is to extract all the small molecules from those cells and then analyze them and see how can you correlate the expression of changes in the gene, changes in the protein, and, and are these changes are reflective of what we can see in the small molecules. So these are some of those uh, findings from those studies is that you can see here, Normally what happened under, under natrium starvation is that uh, under natrium starvation, almost all the amino, because it, it, it result in breakdown of, of proteins, all the amino, essential amino acids levels are down. Whereas here you can see, uh, maybe not here because this, also, this is central carbon metabolism. So you can see here, there is increased flux or increased levels of starch and, and uh, uh, glucose, uh, glycolytic pathway components, which drive the carbon flux through the glycolytic pathway via the TCA cycle. As you can see here, in some cases, there is increased level of citrate. And we have already shown that in natrium starvation, that uh, citrate, increased level of citrate has some role in the uh, lipid accumulation why the TCA cycle and glyosylate cycle. And finally, it end up into uh, the endoplasmic reticulum where it assemble into tag. Okay, so this is how um, uh, the metabolism works uh, when we do uh, treat those algae cells with this kind of a drug-like molecule. And okay, so this is what I was saying about amino acids. So under nitrogen starvation, most of the amino acids will be down-regulated or they will be reduced. Whereas here, you can see that in most cases, uh, the amino acid levels are either, either maintained or it's slightly increased. So red means increase, uh, white means no change, and, and blue is decrease here. So once we, we did all these experiments, so our main aim was to identify what was the protein target where 
these drugs are binding and, and can we use certain uh, uh, method to identify them? But target identification is a very tricky and very difficult task because uh, target identification can be hampered by, uh, it could be by a weak interaction between compound or drug and your protein target. Uh, it could also be hampered by the low abundance of your protein target because if your protein is in low abundance, it's very difficult to uh, identify it. Or there is a possibility that uh, there could be high abundance of non-specific binding. Or, <clears throat> and the fourth thing is that uh, if you can't find a, a functional group to attach a fluorescent tag on a small molecule, then it's very difficult to do that. And to do this kind of experiment, uh, people have used uh, we can use label the small molecules in using radioactive fluorescent probes. Or you can use photo affinity cross-linking or, or surface plasma resonance assay. And there are non-invasive uh, and biophysical assay called as cellular thermal shift assay and drug affinity response to target stability assay. So I'm going to talk about these two first. So in the affinity chromatography assay, what we do is that uh, our drug of or a small molecule, we immobilize on a bead, okay? And then we do a, uh, take some cells, uh, and then we open that, those cells, uh, and then we pass that cell lysate over the column of the, uh, over the column of the bead, okay? And if the small molecule find the target protein, the target protein will bind to that small molecule. And once, it is bound, then we wash those uh, uh, immobilized bed with a, a washing buffer. And finally, we run that those immobilized uh, 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 material on a gel so that we can see what that protein is. This is one way of doing it. The second way of doing it is something called as drug affinity uh, responsive target stabilization. Okay, so this is a kind of a biophysical technique where uh, people have used certain proteolytic enzymes such as thermolysin, subtilisin. So these enzymes are very specific that uh, they can cut at a very specific site on a protein sequence, but they don't do complete uh, uh, proteolytic digestion. They just do partial digestion. Okay, and, and the idea is that if any protein is attached with a drug, okay, then it will resist that degradation, which means, um, say for example, this particular sample or this particular cell lysate, it is not treated with any drug. And, and, and when we treat this lysate with a proteolytic enzyme, all the proteins will be chopped into small peptide fragments and when we run it on a gel, you won't find any intact protein. Okay. Whereas in this situation, if some drugs are present along with the, the in the lysate, and, and if the drug find its target, so what would happen? There will be a drug target complex, and the drug target complex cannot be degraded by the proteolytic enzyme. Okay. And when we run it on a gel, we can identify. A, a band which we can excise and, and sequence and identify what that protein is. There is another technique, which is again a kind of a biophysical technique, which is called a cellular thermal shift assay. Again, in this situation, the same, same uh, kind of theory is that whenever we take a mixture of protein and if we heat it, what would happen? The protein will start degrading and denaturing and then they start settling at the bottom because of denatured proteins but any protein which has which is bound with a ligand or, or a small molecule that will resist the uh, aggregation and and that's how you can identify that particular drug compound so again here what we do is that we will have one tube with uh, uh, with cell acid 
and only the carrier vehicle called DMSO. And in another situation, we'll have a cell asset with drug compound. And then we heat them at different temperature. And as the temperature started to increase, uh, more and more protein started to get aggregate. Okay, but any protein which is bound with the drug will not aggregate. And, and that's how you can resolve that on a, on a, uh, a 1D gel or SDS page, or you can use certain astropic uh, peptide labeling techniques such as eye track or TMT, and then using uh, uh, sophisticated uh, proteomics uh, approach, you can identify their target uh, uh, and, and we can relate, uh, correlate their intensities based on different temperature because here we can use different temperatures and multiplex that thing in a single experiment. So in conclusion, I can say chemical genetics uh, offer a new approach to identify gene function where, where traditional genetics is maybe difficult and time consuming. But for to make chemical genetics uh, popular, more popular, and a standard technology, uh, we need to have easy access to chemical library, uh, which is a bit of a difficult situation right now because these are very expensive to maintain. But the good thing is that recent development in technology such as high content screening, robotics, and automation is helped to popularize this area. So you can you can see that with, like with this pandemic. And with the COVID-19, every day hospitals and, and labs are analyzing thousands of samples for COVID testing and how they are doing it. It's, it's because of robotics and automation. That's how people are screening and, uh, and, and testing thousands of people every single day. So this is possible. It's not that it's not, that it's not possible, it is possible. The thing is that we have to popularize it. Uh, there are new, new, new techniques available for target identification, such as SETSA, DARTs, and, and amino acid pull down. And, and the new genome editing techniques such as CRISPR, Cas9, and, and RNAi. And combination with the gene chemical genetics, we feel that it could be a powerful tool in biology. So, with this, I'll stop here. And uh, uh, these are uh, Currently, uh, my colleagues which have, with whom I worked in, in University of Virginia, uh, earlier when I was in Nebraska, Panchita Di Russo was my boss for seven, eight years. I worked with her, Paul Black, our department chair, Obata, Iri Atmeg, Ronald Sarney. These are my different collaborators from uh, Kansas University, Anu Roy. And I'm thankful to all those people who provide money to do all these fancy things. Otherwise, uh, this couldn't have been possible. And thank you very much for this opportunity and for your patience uh, for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions if you have. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for a very enriching session on chemical genetics to study biology and technologies to popularize it. But thank you, sir. I now request Dr. Vijay Hile, Head Department of Botany to moderate the question and answer session followed by the vote of thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, sir, you have delivered very informative and useful talk. Thank you once again. Uh, sir, some questions are here. Uh, mm -hmm. one, uh, one is, why did you select mm -hmm. microalgae chlamydomonas for your research work? Well, the reason why we select microalgae chlamydomonas is that because it is the most widely studied model organism. Okay, so all over the world, anyone who wants to study microalgae for any purpose, they use chlamydomona, just as we use um, uh, Arabidopsis as a, as a model plant in, in plant research. We use Drosophila as a model organism, model uh, in insect research. So it is just like that. So can we use uh, marine algae for the same? Any, any marine algae? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean... I, after I screened this in 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 uh, in Chlamydomonas because Chlamydomonas is a freshwater algae, so after that I have tested these these compounds in Nanochloropsis and, and several other marine algae as well. Uh, it worked in some, it didn't work in some. It's like that. Uh, sir, one more question here. Uh, 
what is the role of nile red stain in this experiment okay so the thing is that all these cells what we are looking for is uh, presence or absence of small microscopic droplets of lipids inside a cell which and each cell is like 5 to 7 micro uh, microns in diameter which is very even difficult to see through a naked eye or even see through a normal microscope okay and to look at the lipid content inside the cell it's very difficult that's why we have to use something which shows fluorescence okay and this is a fluorescence stain where uh, you just uh, treat this algae with the stain and if it has more lipid it will show more uh, brighter color okay so to, to identify that we have to use certain marker and that this is the one of the marker thank you sir one more question sir from 43000 mm-hmm. compounds you have select only five compounds for your research work mm-hmm. which are the specialities in this five compounds okay the specialty the reason why we selected this uh, and and the specialty for this compound is that number one this compound can make the algae to make more lipids number one secondly it do not need any nitrogen starvation thirdly it do not stop the growth it do not degrade the proteins it do not degrade the chlorophyll pigments okay so these are the criteria we decided that we want to use it but the the next problem for for us is that say for example if you want to use this compounds or, or these chemicals on a large scale just like in a in a scale of agriculture okay then we have to think about uh, ru- uh, the run off of this compound in soil leaching how long this compound can stay in soil can it be readily biodegradable you have to think about all these things because once you come up with this kind of molecules you will have the epa the anomaly production agency after you that they have to show how safe these compounds are for the common use for the common people because once you bring it outside the lab uh, in a pond which means that the pond water will be leach and go into the soil and it will run into the whole food chain so we have to make sure that these compounds are safe to use so these are the so many different things to consider when we when we do uh, when we try to bring a research from laboratory to the field thank you thank you sir sir excuse uh, me sir there is one more question mm-hmm. and comment uh, in a chat box dr mm-hmm. vase your uh, research is excellent is such research mm. is going on in india if as which lab sir um i am afraid i don't know anyone i i know there are few uh, labs uh, uh, which are working on microalgae and uh, trying to understand um like trying to improve the petroleum content there are certain uh, labs in in uh, i think some south southern universities uh, trichapalli university and there are few universities i think delhi university has a department and some people are working on it icgb is working on it igib is working on it and then even in bombay you have the uh, ict uh, the department of energy institute in matunga i think uh, they are working on some part of this um, uh, if you look at the uh, private players then i think reliance industries is looking at it uh, different Uh, uh petroleum companies like exxon mobil british petroleum they all are looking at it but the problem is that after 2012 2013 when <clears throat> they found a kind of a gas reserve called a shale gas okay so before 2012 2013 the oil prices were very high because the uh, the 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 per barrel rate was around 140 dollars per barrel okay and this is the reason why petrol was very expensive all over the world but after 2012 2013 as they found the shale gas and shale gas is that uh, the geographical topography is very difficult once you open that well 
to extract the, ga the gas, you can't close it. Just like you can control the uh, gas uh, oil production in, in Middle East, their, their topography is different and they can control it. But in the shale gas uh, formation, you can't control it. That's why they have to extract everything and bring it in the market. And that's how all the petrol prices crashed after 2014. That's why uh, from $140 per barrel, it came down to $30 per barrel. That time, you should have get petrol in India at 20 rupees per liter. What you get is 70 rupees per liter. That's a different issue, but this is the fact. But slowly, uh, that source of petroleum dries out, and now you can see slowly the prices are increasing. And because of the crash of these petroleum prices, a lot of money which was driving this research of, of biofuels, they moved to some, uh, to some other direction. So most of the time, it is like that. So a lot of research is done on the whims and fancies of uh, government policies most of the time. And, and this is one of the policy, uh, one of the result of that policy. But yes, there are a lot of labs working in, in India as well, but the focus is now slightly uh, taken aback. Uh, it's slightly shifted now. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, one and all. It is indeed my honor to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of Bhavan Sajarimal Sumani College of Arts mm -hmm. and Science and Jaram Das Patel mm -hmm. College of Commerce and Management Studies, I, Dr. Vijay Hile, Head of the Botany Department, extend my heartfelt gratitude to all those who made this session a remarkable event. I'm very grateful to Dr. Nishikant Vase for agreeing to be the resource person for this session and also deliver a very comprehensive and lucid presentation on chemical genetic screening approach to study biology in microalga. We are truly overwhelmed with your active participation and look forward to a fruitful association in future as well. Thank you, sir. Sure, sir. Yeah, sure, sir. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if you have or if any of students have. I think I put my email ID on that uh, 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 final part of the talk. If you have any questions, uh, feel feel free to send me any mail, and I'm happy to answer it. Uh, other sure. than the technical questions or scientific questions, if anyone needs any help in, uh, in studies, um, if they are trying to find any position in 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 in, in out of India or US, um, I'll I'll try my best to help them in any way I can. Sure, sir. Thank you so much. Over to Rina, ma'am. Thank you, Vase, sir. Thank you, Hile, sir. We shall now move on to plenary talk 10. May I now request Dr. Mr. Swapnil Shewade, co-convener, to introduce the speaker for plenary talk, Dr. Sanket Joshi from Oman. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Reena Patel, madam. It is indeed a great privilege to have amongst us Dr. Sanket Joshi, Deputy Director and an Application Specialist, Oil and Gas Research Center, Sultan Qaboos University, Oman. Dr. Joshi has completed his graduation and post-graduation degrees in microbiology from Sardar Patel University, India, and his doctoral degree from Maharaja Sayaji Rao University of Baroda, India. He has 16 years of academic teaching and research experience and four years of industrial R&D experience in India and Oman. While working in Indian pharmaceutical industries, he undertook several turnkey projects on antibiotics, anti-diabetic drugs for type 2 diabetes, and coenzyme Q10. His current research interest encompasses energy, microbial products, and environmental bioremediation. These research projects are multidisciplinary, involving both biotechnology and engineering disciplines. He is an active member of the MEOR research team at Sultan Qaboos University since 2009. During his tenure, his research team has received over 4.13 million US dollars as research grants and service contracts and established byproducts for petroleum and environmental applications. 
डॉक्टर जोशी वॉज रैंक ट्वेंटी सेवेंथ इन सुल्तान कबूस यूनिवर्सिटी अमंग टॉप फाइव हंड्रेड ऑथर्स बेस्ड ऑन द नंबर ऑफ साइटेशन फ्रॉम टू थाउजेंड टेन टू टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन फ्रॉम स्कोपस एल्सवेयर He has about 128 scientific publications in international journals, book chapters, conference proceedings, and two international books to his credit. He also serves as an associate editor and a recognized reviewer for about 51 globally reputed journals, including Nature, Elsewhere, Springer, and Frontiers, to name a few. Further. he served as an intermediate guide for 30 graduate students and 3 phd students in india and in oman dr joshi is also the recipient of the nri senior scientist award from microbiologist society of india with this brief introduction i request dr sanket joshi to deliver his plenary talk on petroleum industry and microbial biotechnology opportunities and challenges the screen is yours sir thank you swapnil can you hear me yes sir okay thank you so let me start by sharing the screen Okay, let me bring it down. If it comes down, yeah, it's coming down. So, welcome from Oman. Thank you, uh, Swapnil, for giving a crisp introduction about me and uh, informing me about this opportunity. And I would also like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share some of the work what we are doing here in Oman. So now let's uh, shift our focus from green gold, which I would like to call algal research, an excellent presentation from the. let's shift our focus to black gold which is crude oil so let's get dirty so what we'll be learning today will be about how microbial biotechnology can help us in petroleum industry and what are the possible applications and challenges so what will we learn today like why research on crude oil when we all are talking about fossil fuels are problematic and biofuels and more and how microbial biotechnology is related to fossil fuel research so we'll study what are the roles of microbes in the petroleum industry basically it's an environmental friendly practices and some of the applications as an example enhanced soil recovery bioremediation and recycling and uh, we will conclude with what are the opportunities challenges and possible future prospects so before we go into details about the technical talk i would like to share one slide about the place where i am from or where i am working right now so i am um, working in sultan qaboos university it's a government university here in oman and the foundation was laid by visionary late his majesty sultan qaboos in year 1980 it was established in 86 with the first batch of 500 students so it's comparatively younger university in fact younger than me we have different colleges college of science engineering nursing medicine agriculture and marine sciences arts commerce different research centers a very big and very well facilitated hospital and more and uh, i'm proud to say that within such a short span the university is in top 500 universities all over the world and the rank in last 2019 was around 375 so it's all because of a nice and uh, good support from government and universities which is promoting research and excellent hard work by all the people here and young students so let's start about the topic so before we go into the understanding petrol or something i would like to share again one slide for the history and <clears throat> just to give a little bit of background so fire fuel and oil so how you can correlate with this work so basically when if you look into the history of human kind the discovery or the control use of fire by early humans our ancestors was actually a turning point in the cultural aspects of humans as an evolution as a specific species we started learning how to use fire to cook food for protection to make a praise run away from us and more so what our ancestors used to use mainly plant based wood then they started learning animal dungs can also be used then they discovered plant based oils and animal fats can also be used as a fuel 
And then we started going for sea voyages and everything. So when we started exploring the planet, we started hunting for whales and other sea animals. And we found out the knowledge of whale oil. So if you are into reading books and everything, you must have gone through Moby Dick or the whale, like the picture in the center. So we almost killed so many whales just for the whale oil because it was a very good commodity. We almost bring, we almost brought our whales to the extension. So this was the era. And then the discovery of crude oil and derivatives started onshore. And then it was a new era of fuel, which is still going on. So even though renewables are going to be the preferred choice of energy, crude oil will still there be in the uh, applications for many more years to come. Why so? Because of this, we know crude oil and fossil fuels as mainly into transportation, but that's not the only application of oil and gas. As nicely presented in this infographic, you can see crude oil and its derivatives have applications in almost everything, clothing, construction, fuels, accessories, medicals, medical appliances, furniture, and so on. So crude oil is not just for transportation, but several other applications. So if we go a bit deeper, as the previous speaker also said, we know crude oil as with respect to a per barrel, how much was the cost, how much is the cost you are paying? $110 per barrel, $20 per barrel, and so on. So this is an example of what you can make from one barrel of crude oil. So majority of the crude oil, what you get from one barrel will be sufficient to give you around uh, gasoline or a sm a simple fuel, which can run your cars around 280 miles. You can also get uh, high density, high viscosity diesel, which is sufficient to 40 to 50 miles of a heavy truck. Still, you can get a gallon of tar, which is sufficient for making roads. You can get around 70 kilowatt hours of energy for generating electricity. You can get sufficient LPG from those bottles or propane, as we said, for around 12 cylinders. You can get lots of charcoal. You can get motor oil. You can make wax, which is paraffinic wax for around 170 birthday candles or 27 crayons. And even after you produce and uh, remove all this majority of component, there are still leftover which is sufficient to give you so many other things, which are widely used for many other things. Like around 540 toothbrushes, you will get around plastic cups, what used to be sold in the market for tea, coffee, for your comb, polyester shirts, peripherals for electronics, toys, and many more. So you can see from one barrel of crude oil, many, many things are being manufactured. And if you look at the future forecast, what will be the future? Primary energy consumption by fuels. Several scenarios are depicted in several agencies. So this is one of the scenario, how the world will be, depending on how the policies of international governing agencies and intra-governmental things will be shifted. So this shows in the center graph, it's equivalent to billion ton of energy. So this is 2016 data, and then they are forecasting how the world will be for 2040. So bottom line is for oil. So other energy sources like gas, coal, nuclear, hydro, renewables, and all. So if you look clearly, even with different scenarios, such as one which I like to share with you is ICE ban, that is internal combustion engine ban. Like if you uh, heard about uh, Britain in UK, so they are saying that from year 2030, there won't be any single car with ICE will be sold in the market. So they're saying complete ban on internal combustion engine cars. Even with that scenario, and if you look for all the other scenarios, you will see that oil will be there more or less at the same level. And on the right-hand side, as a fuel also, you can see that 2020 to 2040, oil will be still a major player for a fuel source because there is still time. We will be electronic, electric cars and all those things, but still there is a ample opportunity for crude oil to be there. So where is microbiology or biotechnology in this? So if you studied uh, chemical engineering or biology or whatever, we know that crude oil formation is because of microbial help. How long does it took? It took millions of years. So uh, before around 300, 400 million years ago, the microbes started dying, the planet was shifting, and then the layers and layers, and because of pressure and microbial action, the oil and gas deposits were done. So in the crude oil formation itself, microbes played a big role. Can we do it now? Unfortunately, not at the moment. Synthetic chemistry can help you, but it's a nature's mastery. So at the moment, or maybe in the near future, we can't make crude oil. It took millions of years. But there are other places where microbes are possibly playing a good role, which is in the upstream process and the downstream for the bioremediation and more. So we will see some of these examples where 
we are supporting petroleum industry. So let's have a quick crash course, a slide or two in crude oil recovery for those people who are not from petroleum engineering background. So this slide summarizes you how the world was and how the world is with respect to oil recovery. So if you see on the left-hand side, it's nicely presented with daily food item, what normally we are eating. So on the right hand, left hand side is an image of jelly donut. Like it's a donut with a jelly filled in between. So this is what the conventional way of drilling. Like if you want to suck the jelly, you just put a straw and if you suck. So you just drill and you get the oil recovery. So it was a conventional way of drilling, which is not possible more or less. Now it's more difficult. And what is now happening is the new way of drilling, which is like tiramisu. If you know tiramisu, it's like a French desert. It's a multi-layered cake with cream, chocolate layer, cream, chocolate layer, and like this. So the now new way of drilling or oil recovery is like tiramisu. So you need to go layer by layer. So you need to do horizontal and then you need to do vertical drilling. So it's more expensive, more challenging, and more difficult, which is what you are seeing in US, other part of the world, and even smaller country with respect to oil production, India. But Saudi Arabia is a place where they have more jelly donut kind of oil reserves. So this slide summarizes how crude oil recovery happens and what is enhanced oil recovery. So how it starts? It starts with exploration and locating the oil field. A group of people, geologists, computer specialists, then engineers, they all say that there is a high probability in a certain area. Go and let's drill it there. Then they do the drilling. And then the first phase, which is known as primary recovery phase, which is very simple. As you have seen in the previous slide, millions of years of this crude oil formation happened. So entire system is under pressure. So when you drill, the oil comes out with a pressure because of the natural pressure. And you get around five to 10% oil recovery. How does it happen? If you look at the bottom image, you can see two bottles are there. It's like Pepsi or Coke soft drink bottle. So this is similar to like primary recovery phase. This soft drink is filled with pressurized CO2 and some sugary drink. So if you shake the bottle before opening, and if you keep it there, like we used to do it during uh, old time with gold spot or thumbs up with our college friends, and we shake it and we keep it for them. So we ask them to open it. So what happens when you open the bottle, the soft drink comes out with a pressure on the face or on the table or whatever. So this is what exactly happens in the primary recovery. Because of the pressure, when you drill, the oil comes out. But for how long? as long as the pressure is there. Once the pressure of gas subsides, then the recovery will stop by itself. Then you shift to secondary recovery phase. In the secondary recovery phase, you try to increase the pressure. You drill more wells in the nearby one and you try to inject gas or water. And with it, you try to produce it. So with this secondary process also, you can get around 25 to 30% additional oil, not more. Then you need to go for tertiary phase, which is what most of the oil wells are going on right now. In the tertiary phase, you don't just inject water, you inject other things with water because water and oil are not miscible. So you try to add different things and then you try to make oil and water miscible and then it comes out. So with this tertiary phase also, you normally get around 20 to 30% additional oil. So theoretically or practically, you can never get 100% oil out of the oil well. Oil is always there. You can get 50 to 60%, sometimes around 70% oil, still oil left inside. So in the current scenario, most of the oil wells or the reservoirs in the world are in the tertiary phase of recovery. This is the phase where we utilize microbes also or microbial products. So what sort of products you can use? So don't go into the detail of the slide. This you can easily find from Dr. Google. You can read our papers. Hundreds of papers are available. This is just a summary. Microbes are producing similar. They are small bio factories. It can produce the gas. You can use the gas for oil recovery. Acids, microbes are producing. It's producing solvents. It's producing biosurfactant, biopolymers, and you can use biomass also as a mean for oil recovery. So we will focus mainly on biosurfactants and biopolymers apart from other possible mechanisms. So before we go into biosurfactants or biopolymers, let's see what are surfactants and what are polymers. So in the first plenary lecture, uh, I don't know how many of you were there, um, the uh, first speaker, um, uh, uh, the professor from ICT, he said about something about surfactants. So this is surfactant. It's comparatively smaller molecule with both hydrophilic and hydrophobic moiety. So it has both the groups. It can be dissolved into water. It can be dissolved into oil also. So because of this property, it reduces the tension at the interface between oil and water. There is always a tension. When you pour oil and water, it won't mix. Even if you shake 
heat after some time it gets separated so it's called interfacial tension the tension which won't allow two uh, immiscible liquids to mix so when you put surfactant it mixes two immiscible surf, uh, solutions how do we know surfactants in our normal life we know it as a detergent as you can see some of the images we are using it to wash our clothes to wash our car and many more things even to surface cleaning for washing our hand so it's a surfactant what is a polymer so polymers as the name says it's a macromolecule made up of smaller monomers so around 80% of the polymeric material which are used currently are produced from petroleum industry by products while processing fossil fuels where are what are they they are everywhere they are everywhere since in the morning you wake up and if you are snoozing your alarm uh, or your mobile or whatever it's made up of plastic and then you have your breakfast you have your uh, uh, cereal bowl or anything and everything then you go in your car or a bike you have polymers there till the time you come back to your bed in the night and you sleep so plastics and these polymers are everywhere and these are mainly made up of petroleum industry by products so what are biosurfactants and biopolymers simple these are biological molecules which are produced by microbes plants and animals including us humans we have a surfactant in our lung which is known as lung surfactant so lung surfactant protects us from getting infection it removes the microbes pathogens or something from our lungs so can we use human biosurfactant or uh, we can but for this we need to sacrifice and extract so many humans which is not allowed and it's unethical so what we do we manipulate microbes and several examples of biosurfactants and biopolymers are there which are produced by microorganisms lipopeptides glycolipids and more so when you go to a company such as chemical company or petroleum company and you propose to them this this the past in past like let's say in 2001 or 2002 when we used to approach companies that we have a solution for you but it's a bio based solution so they will say why bio based products we want to use it it's not a cosmetic it's not a human application so why we need to use it when chemicals are already available for us so it took some time for them to understand that there are several advantages if you go for bio based products or green products like it's biodegradable sometimes economic it's comparatively less toxic than chemical compounds you can synthesize it using renewable materials unlike chemical surfactants chemical surfactants are manufactured from petroleum by products but bio surfactants you don't need to use the petroleum products you can use waste product it does better wettability alteration it works well as a viscosity reducer and many more things for the petroleum company it enhances oil recovery from different kinds of reservoirs and it has a better activity so these are some of the advantages which we try to explain to petrol companies or chemical companies and now people are slightly turning towards organics organic pro green chemistry and then bio products also so there are some advantages which puts bio products at better hand than chemical products but this is an important slide as an academician or as a businessman or as an entrepreneur what is the driving force behind a journey from r and d be it in the academics or in a company to industrial scale production application so you need research funding you have an idea you meet with a group of people who are like minded people and then you do brainstorming and then you need fund like previously mentioned also so this fund is only given when the investor or the government seems it important that this can be good this may be good so you need lot of funding so why somebody should give fund for biosurfactant or biopolymer research so let's have an insight about the current market scenario global scenario not just for india or middle east for all over the world so when you look at the data which are forecasted and published the global biosurfactant market was estimated to be around 4.2 billion dollars in year 2017 and it is projected it was projected to reach around market cap of 5.5 billion dollars by next year and with a very healthy rate of 5.6% from 17 to 22 and what are the applications applications are almost everywhere personal care cosmetic industry environmental petroleum and so on like recently some patents and papers are also published where biosurfactant can replace chemical surfactants for washing your hand and it inactivates coronavirus and everything of course it's an initial stage of research none of the patents are given yet but biosurfactant can easily replace this chemical surfactant but if you look at the biopolymer market it was around 2.4 billion in 2016 much less than biosurfactant and if you look at the future forecast it is projected to expand by around 12% to 14% much healthier cumulative annual growth rate 
for between 17 to 25 and the market cap will reach around 9 billion dollars by year 25 applications everywhere wherever you are using chemical polymers plastics like that's another part of research we are also working on we don't want to use plastic plastic is banned in most of the countries even in india mumbai you go to baroda everywhere plastics are not allowed and more and more strict rules are happening so you need to replace plastic with something else so bioplastic could be one of the alternative apart from this it's it's in plentiful of applications so this is the market scenario so there is a lot of potential so people are interested and they are opening new companies into opening biosurfactant or biopolymer companies so where are we so in our research group because our funding agencies are oil companies so definitely we need to do research and application in oil based application so we established a state of art research and service lab and we completed almost 12 years now of r and d and pilot scale production mainly specializing in oil field application so we have five different types of biosurfactant and it's giving 10 to 50 percent additional oil recovery either alone or in combination with chemical surfactants nanoparticles and other components for biopolymer we have two kinds of biopolymers from fungi and yeast and it's also giving 9 to 50 percent of additional oil recovery so this is what we are mainly applying and planning to use it for oil based application so when you go for oil application this slide i wanted to mainly highlight for those people who are not from uh, engineering or mainly petroleum chemical engineering uh, background so when you want to go to the field application you need to do a lot of uh, experiments at the lab so when i say that i have a product irrespective chemical or biological uh, origin this will work in your oil field so i need to do all the experiments using the rock or the core plug from the oil field crude oil from the oil field and experiments at the temperature of the oil field pressure and all the conditions of the oil field so this instrument on your right hand side is known as core flood apparatus so core is a rock if you look at the image here this uh, satellite image with this flow diagram this uh, first bottle is crude oil the one in the middle is once the core plug is without oil this is how it looks and on the right hand side is the core plug slightly dirtier so how do you find crude oil so crude oil in the reservoir is not like a swimming pool or like an ocean that you go you drill and you get the oil but it's in between hard rocks how hard is the rock it can be like your marble it can be like a sand it can be like a different version so different porosity and permeability so it's too tight and it's quite challenging condition so when we do experiments we need to do experiments from sub zero temperature up to 450 degree centigrade temperature also because when you do steam injection the temperature goes beyond 300 and the pressure can be around atmospheric to 2500 plus psi so it's very high pressure high temperature and wide range of applications if your molecule works in core flood apparatus then there is a higher probability that it will work in the field also so this is just to give a short idea how we do experiments in the lab before anybody can allow you to go to the field so this slide shows you the journey from lab to the field application i uh, don't go into the detail again this is a published paper you can refer from our group or from our, uh, other people also so this is a mainly a slide shows phase study like we uh, because i worked in a pharma companies before so clinical trials and everything we have phase 1 phase 2 and phase 3 clinical trials so more or less similar in oil companies they follow this phase 1 is the laboratory study which is the longest time taking study it can take anything from 5 to 10 years to 50 years an outcome can be zero or something most of the times product will fail you have to do all sorts of experiments which are needed for oil companies you have to make sure that your product is stable effective and everything once it's fine then it can go for phase 2 in the phase 2 you, you need help of simulation mathematical modeling so you collect all the data from your experiments the data from the field and you try to simulate the situation if it works well if the model fits and if the probability is higher you go for scale up scale up is the production you need to produce previously in the lab study you are producing in flask 50 ml 50 microliter whatsoever but in the field you need thousands of liters per day so you need to produce it in a bulk so you can go for a pilot scale 100 to 300 liter bioreactor you have to go for more than 100 kl bioreactors and then you go for single well or five well treatment you inject your product as shown here in the picture the product goes inside the oil well it does the recovery and from the producer well you collect the water and sample and you see how effective is your product and then again you go back to the simulation because this is just a one well treatment 
when you say the reservoir it's in kilometers and kilometers of area so it's not homogeneous it's a heterogeneous system and quite challenging and you don't know what is happening 5 km or 1 km below your feet everything is happening underground so after all those experiments you sit with the company you calculate the economy and economics and everything if it makes sense you go for phase 3 so phase 3 is the full fill application most of the products be it chemical or biological or whatever dies either in phase 1 or in phase 2 and very few goes to phase 3 also so this is just to given overview so where are we now as you know we have done we are doing research for more than 12 years i am doing research for more than almost 20 years in uh, oman for past 12 years so this slide shows all the work what we did in past decade or so so we isolated the microbes from the oil field from oman because in the microbiological work normally if i buy a microbe from us which is isolated from us or let's say any cold country it may not work here because in us temperature can be minus 50 minus 20 here in middle east temperature will be plus 50 degree centigrade or 60 degree sometimes even higher so those microbes which are working there they are producing specific product it may or may not work here so the solution to the problem is to the pollution so i need to isolate micro from oman because they are native microbes we isolated then you need to sequence you need to identify you need to go for full sequencing and then we identified using morphology we optimized media we optimized production and then we did scale up in a small bioreactor then we did scale up in a 100 liter bioreactor and now we are into next phase we are planning to go for a pilot scale study hopefully this year so this is the work of our group for biosurfactant based recovery or biopolymer based enhancing oil recovery then another one was using microbes as you have seen in the slide of the table the bottom portion was biomass you can inject microbes these microbes can go inside the oil well and still it can help you the oil recovery but to do so microbes should be capable to grow in the oil reservoir where the temperature is very high there is no oxygen there is no carbon source heavy metal radioactive materials and all sorts of challenge like in the space so what are you looking for you are looking for for extremophiles or microbes which can grow under these extreme conditions without oxygen so we do experiments in anaerobic chamber then these are the microbes this is the rock plug core it's a solid rock so microbes grows inside so this is a rock without growth of the microbe this is the acm and these are the images of microbes after it grows inside and this is the normal image so once these microbes grows inside the core plug it gave us around 27 to 30% of additional oil after 11 hours of incubation so this is another way and in the oil companies it is known as microbial profile permeability modification mppm so microbes are modifying the permeability profile of your oil well or also known as selective plugging by for biological um, term selective plugging is it is plugging the oil well high thief zones so till the last slide we have seen how to make more money how to recover more oil and using different biological products or microbes now let's shift our focus to bioremediation so microbes won't only help you in upstream or downstream processes for making money in the oil companies it plays a very big role in bioremediation also so the one example is oil spill bioremediation oil spill is not a new word for us when i was a kid i used to hear about oil spills in the books in the newspapers and everywhere oil spill is nothing but leakage of oil crude oil or crude oil product so normally it is categorized into four groups from minor to disaster depending on the amount of spillage if it is less than 25 barrels of oil it's known as minor if it is more than 2500 barrels it's known as a disaster but irrespective minor or major it is an extremely dangerous situation and it's an grave environmental threat either in marine sources or on the land because crude oil is highly toxic and it takes years to degrade how such things can happen so this kind of oil spill can happen and can enter the environment via accidental release from the oil well when you drill the oil well the first when you drill it the oil comes out like a fount like a fountain like if i don't know how many of you have seen the bore well in india like when we i, I was small we had a problem of water in uh, borivali i was in a bombay i was i grew up in bombay so our society did a bore well so i was quite small so when they drilled the well the water came out like a fountain so it's a similar situation in the oil well or you must have seen it in the movies or in the uh, the uh, documentaries so because of accidental release also oil spill can happen the disposal pond 
normally when they produce oil they dispose some of the oil in the pond and they collect it near the oil well abandoned oil refinery sites so when the oil production becomes very low then they stop producing oil when you produce oil oil comes out with water so when the water is more and oil is less it's not economical anymore so they close the rig it's known as oil rig so once you close the oil rig it still produces oil and it keeps on contaminating the environment pipeline blow up sometimes accidentally or by terrorist activity because oil has to be transported from the production well to the refinery and sometimes it can be kilometers of length accidental breakup or intentional breakup and the oil will be seeping everywhere during transport by sea or by road or something and so many other possibilities are there so it's a grave disaster as you can see in the bottom right corner graph a figure where several of such disasters which are reported in the history so i would like to give an example why uh, we did work on this oman is an example if you look on the graph on your right hand side actually oman is quite near to uh, india if you look at the google map you can come by sea of course i, I don't know how to swim and i can't swim um, 500 or 1000 2000 2000 kilometers but if you can swim from mumbai you can come to muscat directly it's very near to gujarat and uh, border of maharashtra it's very near so if you look at the image the geographical location of this area particular area and oman in the nearby region it's highly susceptible for oil pollution from normal operations transport and everything because more than 50% of the oil world oil is transported through the gulf we have uae we have qatar if you go slightly uh, top side you will have iran you will have saudi arabia so this is the this is the area where most of the oil is produced and it's transported by sea route as you can see here this part is oman so everything is transported through gulf of oman this is iran and this is oman so this area is highly susceptible and if you look at the history in year 1972 top 10 worst oil spills in the world one happened here in the gulf of oman here when two uh, tankers from brazil and south korea it collided because of uh, some confusion in the communication and it spilled 35.3 million gallons of oil so it's a huge quantity and that was a great disaster and we are still trying to recover out of it so oil will be settled and degraded from the surface but it goes down and contaminates everything including coral reefs the marine species and all so this area particular area is very much vulnerable so people are looking forward for solution not just in the sea for transport but on land as well so some of our uh, students one of the student from phd from um, oil company he did work with us and we isolated some microbes uh, which are capable to do biodegradation if you look at the bottom left corner picture you will see three petri plates so those guys who are working in uh, anti -micro anti microbial agents or uh, microbiology or biotechnology background you must have done experiments of uh, anti microbial assay where you will see zone of inhibition you develop a new product this is an old method of analysis you puncture the uh, holes or wells in the agar containing media and you pour your control your dmso or depending on where you are solving dissolving your chemical compound or biological compound and you let it grow so different microbial strains uh, antimicrobial resistant or normal strain pathogenic strain and you let it grow if the microbial compound is good as compared to control it will give a bigger zone of inhibition so what we did we replicated similar principle for petroleum work so microbes we put it in the center and we cover the plate with crude oil so microbes either degrade oil or they produce enzymes such as lipase or lipid uh, degrading enzymes so if the microbe is capable to degrade by itself or by with respect to enzyme it will give a bigger zone of clearance not inhibition zone of clearance so this was just the image so we had some of the microbes which are doing quite good job within 14 to 18 hours we identified some of the microbes these are the acm images of the microbes and if you look at the top corner two images this is gas chromatography so the one in the center is oil without degradation and one in the right is after degradation so if you look at the name of the microbes no wonder we found some pseudomonas putida also why pseudomonas putida because it was one of the first microbe which was patented this is highly capable microbe it degrades almost anything and everything crude oil pesticides pcb polychlorinated biphenyls you give it a name this microbe had a very good tendency and it's more or less similar to pseudomonas mendocina also so some um, creative people they uh, published this image few years ago like two bacteria 
they are talking to each other and they are eating something they are saying i don't know what is this fuzz is all about this stuff is delicious they are eating something so these are actually two pseudomonas put it are talking to each other and they are eating the crude oil so they are very happy with crude oil so not all of us but some of us are quite happy with crude oil also so just to uh, put it in a funny way that microbes can degrade crude oil also and we have some microbes so when we are in the a final round of discussion to take it further and apply it on land for such sort of uh, crude oil degradation and it's giving good result to us the second issue is hydrogen sulfide and some of our work so hydrogen sulfide is normally produced by srb which is known as sulfate reducing bacteria so when there is sulfate these bacteria they will reduce sulfate and they will produce h2s so it produces sulfur gas so since the beginning of commercial oil production which was around 140 or 150 years ago petroleum engineers were always facing the problems caused by microbes which is one of the reason when you say to an oil company that i am a microbiologist or i am a biologist and i would like to help you out they don't like you so actually they don't like you as such they don't like you because they correlate you with these microbes this is highly notorious microbe it's everywhere so sulfate reducing bacteria were mainly recognized identified using normal biochemical test initially now we do ngs next generation sequencing to identify it and it produces h2s in the reservoir or in the top facility so what is the problem with h2s it reduces the crude oil quality and it's known as souring of oil well so if your crude oil contains high h2s because it's soluble in water soluble in oil then the oil is acidic so the cost of your per barrel of oil will be less because whosoever buys your oil they have to remove this h2s and it's an additional expense so they will give you less money so your oil quality will be less you don't want it it's an acidic gas so what it will do it will corrode all the steel material in the pipeline you produce it in the reservoir and you transport to your facility so the pipelines are in kilometers so this h2s containing crude oil will corrode your steel material so what will happen you have to replace these pipelines more often because of the corrosion it's called as microbial induced corrosion mic so they don't like it because again you need to put more money and then it threatens workers health due to high toxicity which is the main thing so how much toxic is it it's highly toxic so normally h2s is known as sour gas it's highly flammable with a single spark it's more flammable or more or less equal like oxygen it will go like a bomb it's a colorless gas so if it is produced it is available here we can't see it and it is toxic even at very low concentration it's heavier than air so what happens if h2s is leaked or produced it will stay in the height of 7 ft to maximum 8 ft so our height is more or less 6 ft 5 5 11 6 or whatever so we will always be in contact with h2s and it accumulates in low lying area under the table under the refinery pipelines in the corner everywhere so normally it smells like rotten egg those people who are eating eggs they know then they say anda sad gaya so basically it smells horrible that smell is because of h2s so if you can smell rotten egg then the concentration will be in the range of 10 to less ppm so only this is what you can smell or sense if it goes 100 ppm then it will affect your nerves and you will lose sense of smell so even if h2s is there you can't smell it at higher doses like 700 ppm or less than that you will start feeling dizzy you will start vomiting and at 700 plus ppm a person will die with a single breath you smell and you don't know you are smelling h2s because it kills your nerves and you will die so 700 ppm is very low concentration so some of the oil wells if you go to the field they have around 50000 ppm h2s so it's highly dangerous situation first of all you are working with crude oil highly flammable gas oil or whatever you don't want anything to happen if you have h2s it increases the danger so this is highly notorious uh, micro in the oil company and situation but normally they plan everything very well you are not allowed to go to the field without having a certificate you have to clear an exam in exam you need to get 99.5% marks minimum because it's a matter of life and death and you have to always work with two people if an oil field or reservoir is contaminated with h2s you will look like a astronaut or like a scuba diver you need to have the bottles of oxygen and everything with you and apart from this it's highly inflammable so it's highly dangerous situation so they normally take care of it nicely and most of the time very less 
accidents happen because of h2s nowadays because they contain situation very well you will see this kind of warning signs like always warning signs will be there a kilometer before when you go to the oil field hazardous area hydrogen sulfide and they won't allow you to go without seeing your certificate these certificates are normally given by uk shell india many places so what are we doing here so we mapped entire oil wells of oman using molecular biology techniques we introduced this molecular biology technique to these engineers that this is more reliable like if you see in the bottom pictures we have a sanger uh, sequencer 3130 xl it's an old now we replaced it we have droplet digital pcr we have full genome sequence ion torrents and more so almost 280 oil wells in oman and other oil reservoirs we did the mapping and we said which kinds of oil wells are already sour higher srbs which oil wells are having higher probabilities and which are still sweet sweet oil means not yet h2s produced and we give them prevention and mitigation plan so this is what we are supporting oil companies for h2s related issues and recently we completed a project for an oil company where we gave them the solution how to avoid this souring or if the oil well is already sour how you can convert it back to sweet oil well using microbial technology so this is also one of the application where we are supporting them this is a slide where most of us can correlate h palm is no it's a polymer it is chemical polymer which is used for oil recovery so what are the problems so we don't know h palm as a normal man h palm is a partially hydrolyzed polyacrylamide in the biology lab we know polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis page for protein profiling and everything so when you are making the page gel we use acrylamide monomer and when with acrylamide bis acrylamide and everything so always your teacher or guide or supervisor will ask you to wear gloves not to discard things here and there and everything why because acrylamide is a neurotoxin you have to discard everything properly so acrylamide is a monomer h palm or polyacrylamide is a polymer it is used for oil recovery most of these engineers who are in the field they don't know about it so as such h palm is not carcinogenic but when you produce oil as i said you use water with chemicals or without chemicals to produce oil so when the oil and water comes out you will have oil on the top layer when you let it settle down and the water at the bottom layer so they sell the oil they have to use this water for something they have to discard it if the quantity is less so when you discard this water there are problems it will give problems in the underground table it will contaminate and if you throw it in the open because of uv degradation or microbial degradation it will produce acrylamide it naturally degrades and it's a highly potential neurotoxic or carcinogenic agent so most of the people who were working in the oil well they were unaware of such issues where do you find acrylamide in a normal day to day life if you look at the bottom right corner you must have heard about governments and newspaper that you should not fry fried food is not good okay let's let's forget it we like fried food but when you fry some food organic material french fries and everything in oil then if you use it more than two or three times it produces acrylamide it becomes black so you are not supposed to keep on frying food in the same oil so because it's producing acrylamide and so that's why we know in a normal life that acrylamide can cause cancer but in the oil field they are using it so it's a problem microbes can help you with this some of our project students and our phd student worked on it we isolated microbes from the same oil field produce water and it degraded nearly 60% plus h palm including acrylamide it's very common uh, source you can find out microbes doing acrylamide degradation also so we try to help them now we are in the phase 2 we want to go for a scale up application so this is the last application i would like to share with you yeah we still have time 5 6 minutes so as i keep on repeatedly telling that when you produce oil you produce water because you use water to produce oil so when it comes out there is no single oil in the secondary or tertiary recovery you will always produce water basically you are not producing water you are injecting water with chemicals or without chemicals and it is produced so it's known as produced water in oil companies so what is the problem most of the oil companies are facing two issues in the water management first is dealing with the produced water it's a significant by product we always look when you say uh, crude oil a uh, crude oil per barrel is why it is expensive why it is less so apart from other things the treatment cost will also be added to it so how much is the quantity normally with a current rate we produce per barrel of oil we produce 9 barrel of water it looks small but if you look at the quantity of let's say we have ongc i don't know how much ongc is producing let's talk about the ongc of oman which is petroleum development oman so we are producing 
around 800,000 cubic meter per day of water. 800,000 cubic meter. I don't know you can if you can imagine the size of this water. It's a humongous quantity, and this is per day you are producing. So you will say, okay, what's the problem? It's the water. Salinity is very high. How high? 8,000 to 160,000 ppm. That's the salinity. Only the salt which you are talking about. Sea water salinity is around 25,000 or 30,000. Let's say this is super saturated brine. So this is too much water. And the problem is, again, for enhancing oil recovery, you will again and again need water. So you end up generating more and more water waste. How much is the quantity? It's, it's too much all over the world. And it's a grave problem. And especially here, like in arid regions and most of the oil producing countries, water is more expensive commodity than oil. If I go to fill the tank of my car, I pay less than a bottle of water which I buy to drink. I have to buy the water because here the water which comes to my home is also treated by RO. So RO efficiency is quite less, 25 to 30%. So it's it's very, very difficult situation. We don't have water. It rains once in a year or once in two years. How much? Just to make my car dirty. It's like just it drizzles. So we don't get rain. It's, it's, it's a very difficult situation. And to produce oil, you need water. You can't use seawater. If you are doing recovery in the sea, like in Bombay High, you can use the seawater. But piping, pumping seawater from sea to here is a problem. Plus seawater will have sulfide, 17 plus ppm. So if you have sulfide or sulfate containing water for oil recovery, you will end up producing H2S. So they don't want to use seawater with sulfate. That's another problem. And the water itself, it contains very high salinity. As I said, 160,000. We uh, encountered some samples where you have 200,000 plus ppm of salinity. Very high hardness, crude oil, then polyacrylic uh, uh, pH, norm. norm is naturally occurring radioactive material because the water comes from the bottom of the reservoir. So you will have uranium, you will have other naturally radioactive material, very high TDS, heavy metals, H palm, and so on. So it's a recipe for disaster. It's not possible to treat such a huge quantity of water. So how uh, oil companies used to do it? If you look at the right hand side image, it's an image how people used to do it, which is called as subsurface injection. Or if you have a lot of land, <coughs> excuse me, like here in Middle East, they throw the water and they let it evaporate by itself. And once the water is evaporated, they use the salt or solid for some purpose or they cover it with sand. It's known as open pond evaporation. Or else they go for subsurface injection. What is subsurface injection? It's, it's crazy actually. Before I knew, I, I never knew this. It's like when we produce water at home in India, we use the borewell. So we produce water for our day-to-day -day use. It's like I have a lot of water, so I'm trying to force this water to go back into the ground. So how you can do it? It's not like that you pour a glass of water. You are talking about more than a million liter of water per day, you want to put it back in the well. So it's an energy intensive process. You use pumps and everything to let this water go back just to hide it. It's a very difficult process. So now people are looking forward for other beneficial applications. So one of the application, what we are proposing to uh, the government here, there are several, but one of the application is similar to what a speaker before me showed. It's we are giving them water to value program using algal technologies. To grow algae, you need saline uh, algae. You need a saline water. You need a carbon source. So what it will do, apart from water treatment, it can potentially be used for other applications like generate biofuel, like biodiesel from algal oil, or you can use this algal biomass as a fuel directly by HTL, hydrothermal liquefaction, or else if the water quality is good, not heavy metals, not carcinogenic compound, then you can use algae to grow high value chemicals like nutraceuticals, sarsanthin, or as a biofertilizer. So this is one of the solution we are giving to them. And to grow algae, you need a huge area land. If you do open pond cultivation, or vertical bioreactors and everything. We have a lot of land here. And this kind of a project is also working well. We are in a phase two now. So this is also one of the option by which you can provide service to oil companies, especially for oil field produce water treatment. So I didn't go into details of all those things. Uh, on the left, you can see we publish papers in so many journals. You can search for our name, my name, or any of our team member in the Google Scholar, or you can mail me. And apart from this, uh, theme. Our group is working on chemical enhanced oil recovery using surfactants, polymer combinations with nanoparticles, in situ combustion, and more. In situ combustion is also interesting. It's like a controlled combustion. You 
put a fire in the oil well in the reservoir and then it pushes out the oil it's crazy to sound that you are putting a fire in the oil well but it's a controlled combustion it's known as in situ combustion and then oil comes out we are helping in crude oil transport heavy oil transport with the gas transport we are working on biofuels biodiesel and some of these are work what our group is working on so work under progress is uh, as you have seen our journey for past 10 years or more we are in a phase 2 now so we did scale up in 100 liter or more and by this year or next year we are going for a field application and depending on the size of pilot or the reservoir and the spacer between injector or producer we will need around 5000 to 10000 liter of biosurfactant per day so it's almost like either we will start a new company here or we will produce it outside so this is the plan if things goes well so just to uh, take home message you can see that there is tremendous potential scopes and environmental friendly applications of microbes or biotechnology or whatever name you say in the petroleum industry and bioproducts but we need to be practical also so what are the challenges or future challenges and future prospects so biggest challenge is geopolitical and economic scientific as it was said before also before me in the presentation crude oil price crisis the bubble burst crude oil was 114 dollar when i came to muskat now it's around 40 60 75 it keeps on jumping it's not at all economical when the prices goes down entire market collapses all over the world not just biofuel or petroleum fuel or something everything gets disrupted so when the prices are low it's not conducive for r and d the companies don't want to share money with you they will say you do whatever with whatever you have and make it beneficial so it's a challenge and opportunity also then the change of mindset from petroleum industry towards this microbial applications they are still worried about hus srb and everything it's a still a setback then the economy production and the price competitiveness it's a challenge still as you know bio based products are better or whatever but it's still expensive than chemical products so if you need it in a higher uh, quantity then the price will come down otherwise chemicals will always be cheaper and these companies will end up using chemical products so competition is tough but there is an opportunity what is the opportunity as i said it's a multi billion dollar industry and it can be properly harvested there are plenty of opportunities for all of us if you have a better idea there is an opportunity for you also so with this i would like to finish i'd like to acknowledge the team members these are the team members and the funds given by university oil companies international local all and some of our msc students which are working with us currently you can go to our website you can go to our uh, mur website or university website google scholar you can contact me anytime so thank you thank you sir for a very knowledgeable session uh, particularly explaining the complex recovery process of crude oil so well to all of us thank you for giving an overview of the opportunities challenges and prospects in the use of microbial organism in degradation of crude oil thank you once again sir i now request dr sandeep main convener to moderate the question and answer session followed by the vote of thanks over to you thank sandeep you, sir thank you ms sreena patel am i audible yeah yes yes uh thank you so much dr sanket joshi sir for wonderful and informative talk uh sir one question is there ki the participant would like would like to confirm whether this microbe is used for crude oil recovery or it is used for uh matlab for pollution control to reduce good, the good degradation question. yeah so see microbes are versatile they are not producing oil or degrading oil or doing anything for us it's already there in the nature if a microbe is exposed to oil they need to grow there is a tough competition so what is the food available for them crude oil let's say the crude oil so they produce biosurfactant because crude oil is not water soluble crude oil can't pass your cell membrane so they produce biosurfactant they emulsify it and then it transports to your cell or it produces enzymes it degrades it and the byproducts goes inside so microbes is actually producing oil it's degrading oil and it's growing so it's us who are manipulating them depending on the application so what we do we use microbes or the microbial products for enhancing oil recovery a particular type of microbes or optimized process but if you want to degrade it we use these products to degrade it complete degradation but let's say you want to reduce the viscosity or a heavy backbone to a smaller group let's say heavy oil we don't want to completely degrade the oil heavy oil is expensive and very thick to transport so what we do we put the biosurfactant it makes it light like water 
heavy oil is like shrikhand aam khand like the shrikhand what we eat with the yogurt and sugar and everything so heavy oil is like a thick paste or toothpaste or something so if you produce heavy oil it is very expensive to transport from oil well to the refinery so what you do you want to reduce the viscosity so they do steam injection they inject solvents which is very expensive and problematic separation so we inject surfactants or bio surfactant so it makes it light it mixes with water and it's easy and economical to transport or you chop using the enzymes this heavy oil into lighter oil it's a controlled degradation like catalysis in chemistry we do so it depends on the end use what we are looking forward for and we are using it for all the purposes thank you sir uh next question is uh, in your talk you said ki while processing of fossil fuel in petroleum industry 80% polymeric materials are produced so whether it is used for uh, uh, the recover or recycle or it can be thrown away that is the question uh, the question is about the polymers what we are producing from uh, hydrocarbon based material yeah it can't be degraded simple example plastic all the countries all over the world will trying to reduce the plastic usage including india and elsewhere then the corona came and the amount of plastic what we were using was much less than what we are using now simple example you need ppe which is known as personal protective equipment what we are using here in the lab in the hospital or something ppe is made up of plastic the mask the single use surgical mask what we are using is mainly nylon and plastic it's all single use and throw and we are accumulating plastic more the sample vials and everything so basically these polymers are not degradable biodegradable it takes years 500 plus years like we are working on uh, this problem also how to solve this plastic like one of the thing is plastic pyrolysis so our group was working on pyrolysis using microwave assisted pyrolysis or thermal pyrolysis so these plastics or polymers are made up of hydrocarbon if you can somehow convert it efficiently back to hydrocarbon then it's not a solution but at least it's not going into the sea or polluting our environment or being degraded for years so of course it's not a solution but you are somehow stopping it to go to the environment and of course plastic degrading microbes are also coming one group is working doing excellent work in um, uk we were working with them they have plastic degrading enzymes and everything plastic degrading worms guys are working all over the world excellent work is going on so basically the question is this 80% is not a rule of thumb but majority of polymers used to come from hydrocarbon by products or hydrocarbon products and it ends up in landfills in the land wherever you say it everywhere on the roads and it's it's a nuisance so that's why opportunity is there for something which is biodegradable no need it to be completely bio based but even if the process is green if the degradation is easier like pha pla something mixed plastics or something so bio will play a bigger role it's already playing but it will play even bigger role definitely uh one last question sir mm, you said ki microbes can grow at a temperature minus 20 degrees celsius to 50 to 60 degrees celsius uh, can you specify which uh, microbes are used uh, for this purpose so i when i said microbes can grow i was talking about the versatility of microbes or the place where those microbes are isolated extremophiles like let's say with respect to thermo thermophiles can grow at uh, sub zero or like psychrophiles so normally uh, you look for the bio products let's say uh, simple biochemistry you normally look for the microbe which if it's capable to grow at let's say 40 degrees centigrade most of the mechanism or enzymes or anything which this microbes are producing it should be stable at that temperature or in plus optimum range will be in this range so when you are looking forward for a particular temperature range application or alkaline application or something you look for the microbes which can sustain grow well at that temperature so some of the psychrophiles like one of the group it's it's giving the same service in canada it's a company they are doing this treatment so canada you know like in saskatchewan and all the places temperature goes in minus 50 minus 80 so they are doing microbe based treatment for the oil well when you want to produce oil at the oil well head the oil comes out from the head so it's known as well head so there will be paraffinic deposition and everything so it will be blocked at minus 80 it's like solid rock nothing can come out so you need to do the treatment at the well head so this our colleagues they are doing treatment using the microbes those microbes grows only in canada like in minus 50 and all those temperature and they are doing wonderful job but when we want to do this here we don't have problem of well head deposition because temperature is sometimes 55 or 60 in summer it goes very high so but we have a problem of something else 
we want to recover oil so for that oil recovery we need chemical surfactant or biological surfactant which can work well at these temperatures so the example i gave was with respect to that you need to uh, look for the microbes based on the application from that area if you are into isolation if you don't want to isolate you can always purchase the microbe but when you purchase the microbe you need to keep in mind like i can't just buy atcc microbe for the application research based work is fine i can do research in my lab for projects or whatever but for application i need to look make sure that the purchase is good it should work here i can't just import something from somewhere and it will work here no it doesn't work S same like any other business uh, thank you sir uh, mr sapin shewade any question is there in chat box uh, well, it's not in the chat box i have a personal question sir yeah. related to the topic uh, so sir uh, you had explained about the uh, degradation of oil spills by using microorganism so in this case sir you can be uh, use genetically modified organisms so that to improvise the uh, efficacy of the uh, oil spill which is on the larger scale and uh, similarly sir on the contrary it should not harm the environment or the human sir huh. so answer so okay so answer to your question is yes and no yes means in the lab because being a biologist we know it's it's possible to enhance the genetically modified things and everything but the why answer is no we did this work and when you go to the company um, governments are not allowing to use this gmos for such applications simple example we are doing work on oil degradation there is an oil spill if if i use a genetically modified microbe and if it goes in the oil well it will degrade oil so they don't want it plus it will do horizontal gene transfer as we know like in this kind of a microbes it's like antibiotic resistance we are using so much of antibiotics or we are dumping it so we are facing problem of so many resistant microbes now it's horizontal gene transfer so without modification itself it's happening because of exposure so if you end up using gmos for such work it's not allowed so when we approach the companies first thing they say like don't don't come to us use the native microbes wild microbes which is from the field or whatever nothing else if it was works or not it's fine but no gmo is allowed to enter the oil well or the environment or something it's not allowed research fine if it's a contained lab or something if it goes in the environment we are disrupting the nature already we are disrupting the nature we messed up completely not more not allowed yes thank you sir uh, for your nice presentation and you have given the answer of all the questions uh it is my indeed honor to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of bhavan hazari musumani college of arts and science and jairanda patel college of science and management studies uh, i dr sandeep mai extend my heartfelt gratitude to all those who made this session a remarkable event i am very grateful to dr sanket joshi for agreeing to be a, the research person for this session and also delivering a very comprehensive and very lucid talk on petroleum industry and microbial technology opportunities and challenges we are truly overwhelmed with your active participation and look forward to a fruitful association in future as well thank you sir thank you all participants over to you rena madam thank you yes. thank you dr sandeep moving forward we now head to the plenary talk 11 may i now request mrs veena shinde devre head department of mathematics to introduce the speaker for the plenary talk 11 Dr. Lawrence Gramont, University of Saint Etienne, France. Over to you, Vina. Vina, ma'am, you have to unmute yourself. Good morning, everyone. I hope I am audible to everyone. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ah, uh, thank you, Vina Patel, madam. for giving me this honor just a second uh i meena shinde devri take it as my honor and privilege to introduce and welcome professor lawrence gramont as head department of mathematics bhavan hazari mal somani college mumbai Dr Lawrence Gramont has been teaching mathematics in the economics and management school University of St Etienne France since 1996 she began her research activity in the domain of numerical linear algebra inverse problem 
integral operator equation approximation and Kriging Gaussian process. She also contributed immensely by proposing new methods to solve numerical equations. She was invited as a resource person in the University of Manchester and Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, as well as Madras for several times. She has supervised four PhDs, examined six PhD thesis, and investigated four international projects. In 2005, she turns to approximation of integral equations. This was the beginning of great collaboration with India, particularly with Dr. Rekha Kulkarni, IIT Bombay. Her collaboration with India has been very productive and has led to numerous publications. Some of her works are the publications like a super convergent projection method for nonlinear compact operator equations, extrapolation using a modified projection method, modified projection method for Euison's integral equations with non-smooth kernels. During 2014 to 2017, she has investigated the project approximate solutions of linear and non-linear integral equations with non-smooth kernels, which was funded by Indo-French Center for Applied Mathematics, IFCAM, with the Indian investigator, Dr. Rekha Kulkarni. We are fortunate to have you amongst us to enlighten us on the methods used to solve the numerical equations certain kind of integral equations and the mathematical tools to compare the performance of these different methods. Hearty welcome, Professor Lawrence Glamour. Thank you for accepting our invitation and we are being pleased to see you with us today. Over to you, the screen is all yours, madam. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, So I'm going to uh, put my talk. Uh, can you see uh, my uh, slides? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So um, I thank uh, Vina uh, for uh, the invitation. So uh, it's always uh, a pleasure for me to participate to a uh, conference in India. And, uh, but unfortunately it's by video. So uh, how happy I would uh, have been uh, if it, if it, if, it, I, if I could be in Bombay uh, in front of you. So, um, so I'm from the University of saint Etienne, and I will uh, speak about approximation of integral operators. Uh, this um, uh, this uh, story of uh, approximation of uh, integral operator, it's a uh, uh, French Indian uh, story because I, uh, uh, I began, um, I, I began uh, to work in that uh, domain uh, <clears throat> uh, in, uh, in IIT, Mumbai. Uh, and, uh, okay. and uh, I began to col collaborate with uh, Rekal Kulkarni of IIT Bombay. It was in uh, 2000. Uh, and five, so here it, it was my first uh, 2005 years. It was my uh, first uh, visit to India and to IIT Mumbai. So then uh, after uh, uh, we began a long collaboration and uh, uh, since uh, 2005 and uh, collaboration, that means long trip uh, every year from France to Mumbai in India. So now I will, uh, I will uh, 
speak uh, about uh, integral operators. So uh, K is an integral operators from uh, X, it's a space of function. So I, uh, I uh, show you uh, some example of uh, uh, integral operators. You have different kinds of operators. You can have linear operators like this. So the, the function uh, here uh, phi is uh, <clears throat> intervene uh, here. So for example, uh, I give you a kernel. This is called the kernel, the kernel uh, s to the raised to the power two plus t raised to the power two phi, phi of t dt or uh, the integral operators can be nonlinear. So it's, it's another kind of uh, equation. So the- sorry to, sorry to interrupt you, madam. Uh, yeah. you, uh, have you started the slide show because uh, we are not able to see the slides. Only ah. the first, uh, first uh, page of the slide is there. Ah, you don't see the slide? Ah. Sorry. It's okay. You you don't see the slide? Yes, only the first slide of the waterfall is seen on the screen. Indu mm -hmm. ma'am, uh, you can share the presentation. Hello. Yeah, you, yes. yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes, ma'am, we, we will share the screen. We will share the screen. I, I share the... I share the... Ma'am, please try. Yeah, you see the... Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. It's visible. So, here, yeah, you see the slide? Yes, yeah, it's yes, visible. Yes. Yes. Okay. Excuse me for this technical. Uh, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> so uh, here uh, I speak of different kind of uh, integral operators. So you have linear operator and nonlinear ones. So I put some examples of uh, uh, such kind of uh, operator. So now uh, you have different kind of. Uh, linear uh, integral operator, linear or nonlinear, and you have also different kind of equation. You can have uh, what we call the equation of the second kind. So you have this integral operator uh, intervene here in the equation phi minus k phi equal f, and you have another kind of equation uh, that we call. Uh, Fredholm equation of the first kind, uh, the, the integral operator intervene like that, like that. Uh, uh, K of phi equal F. So uh, many questions can be asked. Uh, we can uh, we can uh, ask the question of the existence and the uniqueness of the solution. We can ask a um, question about the numerical approximation of this equation. And we can, we can uh, also ask some question about stability, sensitivity, and computational cost of uh, the methods. So, here we, we will uh, tackle with the question, with this kind of equation in this talk, and only this question of numerical approximation and error estimation. So it's okay for the, you see the slides? When I change the slide? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so uh, the, <clears throat> The first idea uh, of approximation is very natural. Uh, you, uh, you construct 
a partition of the interval. Here I, I give the example of uh, integral operator uh, and you, int you integrate between zero and one. So uh, you do a partition of zero one with nodes. I uh, call them SI, the nodes. And then you uh, write the equation at the nodes. Uh, so if you write the equation at, at the nodes, uh, it gives this equation. But here, what do you do with this phi? Because you, you are looking for phi. So uh, the natural idea is to uh, seek for an approximate, approximation of phi in the space of finite dimensional, uh, finite dimensional space. Like here, I will give a, uh, an example. Uh, you can take the space of piecewise linear polynomials. So it's generated by the Lagrange uh, basis function. So you seek an approximation of phi uh, of that form. So uh, in this uh, space, uh, the approximation uh, is uh, expressed function of the uh, value of phi n at the nodes, this one. So if you put this form inside this equation, then you will have this uh, n equation. Uh, and here, you have uh, something to calculate. But here, it, the unknown is here and here. So that leads, that leads this, uh, this uh, um, equation, this equation leads to a linear system uh, when the matrix uh, inter, uh, that intervene in the system is given like this. So, uh, this system, um, uh, usually it's well conditioned because you have this form I minus AN. So then after, so when you solve this equation, you, you can have the value of phi N at the nodes. And then to, run, to reconstruct the function, then you uh, express the function uh, with the value of uh, phi n at the nodes that you compute uh, by this linear system. So this, all this method that is quite natural can be rewritten uh, with, in an abstract way with a projection pi n. So you can uh, write all this method and you can, uh, re um, yeah, you can write all this method uh, with this equation, pi n phi n minus pi n k phi n equal pi n f. And pi n is a projection. Here, it's the projection uh, on the piecewise linear polynomial space. Um, and the projection can be written like this. Uh, you can uh, also uh, use other projection. You can use projection, uh, orthogonal projection, or also uh, interpolatory projection on piecewise polynomial of degree uh, greater than one, of degree r. So, uh, uh, so we when you use the orthogonal projection. We called the method Galakin method. So, and uh, the solution of Galakin is written with a G here. If pi n is, the, is an interpolatory projection, uh, then we call this method collocation method. And we write it with a C. And uh, there are theorems that uh, give the error on the method, uh, so uh, it's, uh, it behaves like uh, the error between phi and its uh, projection. 
And for the collocation method, it's the same. So if you want to have the error in terms of the size of uh, the, the grid, here, if you have the, the nodes, the, the nodes of the grid, and uh, H, uh, it's the length between two successive nodes, then you can uh, express the error in terms of this H. Uh, if, uh, for example, if the space is the piece size polynomial space, then the error is uh, behaves like h to the power two for the Galerkin uh, method or collocation method. So this uh, this is uh, okay for when k is linear or uh, when k is also nonlinear. Um, but uh, k must be regular. I will say a word about regular equation. Here. In the next slide. Well, if uh, don't, if uh, Xn is the uh, piecewise polynomial of degree less than R, then uh, the error behaves like R to the power R plus one for both methods, Galakin and collocation. So when uh, R equal one, then you have H2. So uh, when I speak about regularity, the regularity of the operator uh, uh, is the regularity of the kernel. We call this this kernel. So now uh, uh, we want uh, this is uh, in this uh, here. It's uh, the error estimation. So is uh, if you take uh, uh, a coarse grid, uh, H will be quite uh, um, high, and uh, and the uh, error uh, will not be uh, accurate. So uh, we um, researcher try to um, propose methods that are uh, better than uh, than uh, this method. So we seek for uh, approximate super convergence approximation. That means that we want to um, to propose method for which uh, phi, the error is better than uh, the error of the Galerkin and the collocation method. We want uh, an uh, an error which is uh, in h h raised to the power p when p is uh, greater than R plus one. Uh, for R plus one, it's the it's the error estimation of the Galakin and collocation method. So um, around in the in the seventies, uh, Sloan Jan Sloan um, from Australia uh, proposed uh, an iterative version of the Galakin and collocation method. Uh, it, uh, iterate, it, iterated method, that means that if you have the Galerkin method, uh, you seek for, uh, you iterate this uh, solution. That means that uh, the solution of uh, Jan Sloan will be, uh, you apply K to your uh, solution plus F. Uh, so if Galerkin, so we see that Galerkin can express as this equation, uh, then you can show that this solution is the solution of this equation. So that means that you approximate in this iterated Galerkin, you approximate the uh, operator uh, K by K pi n. Uh, as in the Galakin method, you approximate the operator k by pi and k. For iterated collocation method, is exactly the same idea. So if you do so, if you do so, you can have super convergence. 
for the uh, Galen iterative Galenkin method, uh, you have super convergence uh, always. As in iterative collocation, you have an assumption uh, uh, to have super convergence. This assumption is this one uh, here uh, in red color. Okay, but for iterative collocation, if you choose uh, the nodes uh, to be the Gauss uh, Legendre nodes, then you will have the superconvergence everywhere. So here, with that iterative Galakin and iterative collocation at the Gauss point, uh, if you uh, take the projection on the linear piecewise polynomials, if k is also regular, you will have the, uh, the, the error of this iterative Galakin behaves like this term. So you have a k, k uh, applied to i minus pi and phi. And as k is a compact operator, then you will have the order h to the power 4 instead of h to the power 2 for the Galakin method. And here, if you uh, uh, do the projection over the piecewise polynomials of the brain less than R, then you will have the order 2R plus 2 for both methods. Uh, so it's the double of uh, Galakin method. So here it's iterative Galakin, it's not Galakin. So now, uh, if you if uh, I come to the to the ID of uh, Professor Reka Kulkarni, uh, so we see that for both methods, Galakin collocation, iterative Galakin, iterative collocation, uh, we write the equation like that. So you replace k by an approximation an approximate operator, and you replace f by an approximate um, uh, object of F. So for Galerkin of collocation, Kn equal pi and k, and Fn equal pi and f. For iterative projection, Kn uh, equal k pi n, and uh, Fn equal f. And um, Reka Kulkarni propose uh, a new approximate operator to be these red ones. Uh, as uh, Reka Kulkarni has a lot of humility, she didn't want to call this method Kulkarni's method. So she called it modified projection method. So I will call it like her. I respect uh, her humility. So for the, the modified projection method, you can also have an iterative version of this method. So if uh, the modified method uh, solves this equation, then the iterative version can be written as this equation. You apply uh, Kn uh, to uh, the modified uh, solution and you add F. So if you do that, uh, we can prove, uh, Reka has proved uh, that the error estimation is uh, better, much better. If you take, so the, the space of piece by polynomials of degree less than R, then you will have an estimation of uh, h to the power 3r plus 3. And the it iterated version is 4r plus 4. So that is uh, three times better than the Galerkin method. And here, four times better than the Galerkin method. So it's, it's really an improvement uh, over uh, 
the Galerkin iterative Galerkin or collocation iterative collocation. So there, there is a, so I present here the results uh, for a uh, regular kernel. So the, the estimation error depends, in the proof, it depends on the regularity of the solution. And the regularity of the solution depends on the re regularity of the kernel. The kernel is uh, this K of S and T. So you have um, different kind of singularity. Uh, you, you have green singularity, so green kerns, kernels is like that. You have a lack of differentiability on the diagonal. You have weakly singular kernel, like that, log of uh, absolute value of S minus T. You have a lack of continuity on the diagonal, and you also have worse singularity. But we just uh, work on that kind of singularity. And here, for example, for the green kernel, uh, so the green kernel of that type, um, and for the collocation method at ghost point, for collocation, you have uh, an estimation error of R plus one. For the iterative collocation, R plus three. For Kulkarni's method R plus three, so no improvement. But uh, iterative Kulkarni, you have uh, an improvement to R plus three. So you have a lot of job to do if uh, the kernel is not uh, regular. So here, the reference, uh, so Atkinson for this uh, uh, solution of integral equation. Uh, I should have uh, written also um, uh, paper from uh, Jan Sloan and uh, the, the first uh, paper published by uh, Rekha Kulkarni on that subject. So now I come to the nonlinear case. So uh, here we return to the year 2005 when I first visit IIT uh, uh, Bombay and I uh, discover the, the magnificence of IIT campus and also the, the, the humidity of uh, April's day and uh, the, the subject of nonlinear integral operator uh, is, uh, was waiting for us. So that uh, at that year that began our collaboration and we decide uh, with uh, Rekha Kulkarni to, uh, uh, to, uh, to work on uh, integral, nonlinear integral equation. So we, uh, we apply, we adapt uh, her method to nonlinear non -linear case. So uh, if you uh, adopt a very abstract writing, uh, the method, uh, um, is written the same way as for the linear case. But then when we compute things, it's not the same. So here you have the, the, uh, the method, the modified method, and its iterative version. Uh, here I will uh, show uh, some uh, example, numerical example. So here for the numerical examples, of all this presentation, I choose uh, um, an example where the, the nonlinearity is not uh, is quite weak. So this nonlinearity comes in the uh, the function phi is raised to the power two, and the kernel is this one. It's an S here. Sorry, it's in uh, cosinus and sinus. So I uh, recall the, um, the um, results. So it's like in a uh, linear case. Uh, here we have uh, regularity on the kernel. So Galerkin is R plus one, the order of convergence. Iterative, iterative Galerkin is two R plus two. Modified Kulkarni method is three R, 
plus 3, and the iterative version is 4R plus 4. So uh, for the interpolated projection here, it's for uh, orthogonal projection or interpolated projection at ghost points. If you don't uh, take the ghost points, uh, you, the uh, error estimation are not so good. So here, the iterative collocation does not improve on collocation. Uh, the modified uh, projection method improved on iterative collocation, but the uh, iterative uh, version does not improve. So here, so I uh, recall the operator. So the, the right hand side is this one. So we know the solution. But, uh, and here for the numerical uh, results, so we, we will um, take as uh, approximation space um, uh, con piecewise constant or piecewise polynomial. Here we, we take uh, an uniform grid. The collocation point will be the midpoint for the piecewise constant uh, case, the partition point for the piecewise linear or the ghost point. So we will, we will see the difference between these two the third point will give better estimates. So here we will test the, um, the order of convergence for the collocation is with the index C for iterative collocation S, S for Sloan, for Kulkarni's method M and for iterative modified MI. So here, so we can calculate numerically the order of convergence like that. So it's, it's usual in numerical analysis. So here, for uh, collocation uh, midpoint, the expected or order of convergence are uh, one for collocation, two for iterative, three for Kulkarni, four for iterative. And here you compute the um, approximation or order of convergence, and you will uh, find uh, values that match to the theoretical purpose. That is important because that shows that um, the theoretical uh, order of convergence that predict the convergence of the method uh, are um, we can we can uh, say that they are optimal. They are uh, okay because um, uh, the numerical uh, uh, experiments matches the theoretical results. So here we see here it's the error function of n. N is the number of nodes. Uh, if n increase, then uh, the size grid H uh, decrease and then the solution is better. So here for the collocation, you see 10 power minus one to 10 power minus two. With, this, with iterated uh, collocation, you have minus four to minus six. For modified, you can have minus seven. And for the iterated modified, you can have minus 11. So that improve, you see that uh, this, uh, both uh, methods are improving over the usual one. For the uh, where collocation at the particle partition point, not ghost point, so it's the order of convergence, theoretical order of convergence are two for collocation and iterative collocation, and four for Kulkarni's and iterated Kulkarnis. And here you have, so two, around two, around four, around four. So it matches uh, quite well the theoretical results. So for the collocation at the uh, ghost point for uh, linear piecewise polynomial, so you, you have uh, 
uh, R plus one, two R plus two, three R plus four, four R plus four. So the theoretical, the expected order of convergence are two, four, six, eight, and it matches also the theoretical results. So this, uh, the references for this case, so Atkinson and Potrau, uh, Del Wu. So this, uh, these two first uh, paper, they were um, studied the uh, iterated uh, collocation and iterated Galerkin. And uh, this uh, paper, our first paper with uh, uh, Rika Kulkarni. And then uh, uh, we worked a lot about, uh, on this uh, subject. So uh, we worked with a uh, um, social Paolo Vasconcelos of um, Portugal. And then uh, with um, uh, Rika Kulkarni and Akshay Rane, uh, they were working on uh, asymptotic expansion for this uh, solution. Uh, then uh, we worked also uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Nidin, who is a student of uh, Rika Kulkarni. And uh, so here uh, with uh, non-small kernels, there are a lot of job to do. And um, uh, also uh, Gobinda Rapchit, um, that he studies a discrete um, version of this method. And he, 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 def he defended his thesis uh, last year. And uh, it was a very good thesis. So that I will end my uh, talk with that um, section. Uh, for nonlinear uh, operator equation, uh, we can have a new approach that I will um, explain you. So if you write the um, Fredholm equation of the second kind, you can write it like phi minus k phi minus f equals zero. You can write it as a functional equation. So here you seek for phi, the zero of a nonlinear um, operator. So to uh, solve this, uh, this uh, equation, you need uh, to uh, define the Fréché derivatives of this operator f. So here you have to define the Fréché derivatives of the, this operator k. Uh, so the Fréché derivative of this operator, it is the uh, partial derivative of the kernel uh, but in relation with the third variable, u is the third variable, the variable when phi is here. And uh, there is a, a version of newton kantarevich method, a functional version. So you can, you to find the solution phi, phi is a function. So here it's the functional a functional uh, version of this Kantarovich method. So you construct a sequence of function uh, that satisfies this equation. So it's the fresh derivatives of f on uh, phi k applied to phi k plus one minus phi k equal minus f of phi k. And here in this talk, I will take as a discretization method the iterated Galekin that we saw uh, uh, in the preceding uh, slides. All right, so you have to apply uh, to, to solve the nonlinear equation. You have the classical option that I presented here before. So you replace, you first discretize. That means that you first replace k with a finite dimensional uh, kn. Uh, here, for the iterated uh, collocation, kn will be k pi n. So you replace this functional equation to this equation, uh, this equation. And then to solve this equation, that is the, that will lead to a nonlinear equation 
in a finite dimensional space. Uh, so you use the uh, Newton counterage method, but for um, in in a finite dimensional space. So for this method, so if you take the sequence phi and k, this phi and k will approximate phi n. So you can uh, prove that this phi and k they converge to phi n when the, um, uh, the number of iterate, iteration in the Newton counterage seconds uh, is ten, uh, ten, uh, tends to infinity. Okay, so here you are limited by the discretization parameter n, which is the size of the grid. Then we have another um, idea. It was with uh, Professor Mario Alves with, uh, and, this, and two searchers of uh, Portugal, Paulo Vasconcelos and uh, Filomena Dalmeda. So we think of applying first the Newton Cantorvich sequence on the functional, um, functional equation. So that leads to this equation. Here we, we, we just uh, built the Newton counterage sequence. This is, this is in a an infinite dimension space. So then we discretize each uh, iteration and we discretize, we discretized it with the iterated Gallic, uh, collocation. So, so you, you have then a linear equation in a finite dimensional space. Under a uh, suitable hypothesis that I will not uh, enter into details, you will have this convergence. When the number of iteration goes to infinity, so your uh, sequence tends to the exact um, solution. It's not phi n here. So that, uh, what that means, when uh, n is large, large enough, fixed, even if n is not so, so uh, high, it can be a coarse grid. And if you are patient, if you, um, if you take, uh, if you do uh, a lot of iteration, you can attain any desired accuracy. So that is the point. So here I will take the same example as uh, in the form uh, in the uh, usual uh, approach of uh, nonlinear uh, equation. It was with the uh, equation with uh, uh, phi uh, raised to the power two and the uh, cosinus of sinus for the kernel. Then here you have option B, that is uh, the option that you discretize first. So here you see that the solution, and th then here you increase the value of n. So you see here that you converge quite fast, but then if and, and then uh, you, you 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 cannot attain uh, a desired accuracy. You are limited by n because your solution is is uh, converging to phi n and not to phi. So. Yeah, but you converge quite fast, uh, at least quad, quad, quadratically, you can prove it. And for our method, our option, you see here, you see it's 10 to the power minus seven here. And here, you have to be patient because our method uh, converges slowly. But uh, even for n, uh, for n equal 11, yeah, you, it's slowly, but slowly you go to the error estimation of 10 to the power minus, uh, um, minus um, uh, 15. As here, you just stay at 10 to the powers minus two. So here it's like uh, there is a, an old story in, uh, uh, written by a French author, 
that we uh, who is called uh, Jean de la Fontaine. It's uh, the story of the hare and the turtle. So the hare is uh, very fast, but you can but uh, you are not sure that he will attain his goal. And the turtle is very uh, is uh, very slow, but you are sure that you will attend um, his, uh, his objective. So here, uh, for our method, option A, it's the same. It's very slow, but you are sure. So uh, uh, we, we write uh, some uh, paper about that uh, ID, about, um, so with, uh, with uh, our colleague from uh, Portugal, and uh, also with uh, my PhD thesis, uh, Anan Kabou. We also uh, do uh, apply this method uh, with the product integration uh, method. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your enlightening session. Thank you for uh, explaining approximation of integral equation in very simple and lucid manner. I now request Ms. Ambika Sharma, Joint Organizing Secretary, to moderate the question and answer session, followed by the vote of thanks. Hello. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Reena Patel. So uh, we will take some questions from participants now. Uh, Ma'am, we have received a few questions from the participants. Uh, the first question is, uh, which software was used for numerical computations? Uh, we use uh, MATLAB. MATLAB. Okay. okay. Any other software? No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there is another question. Um, are there similar similar results for the eigenvalue problems? You propose the methods for the solution of integral equations. Yeah. Uh, so, are there similar results for eigenvalue problems? Yeah, there are some results. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Rika Kulkarni, Akshay Rane, uh, they published uh, results about uh, eigenvalue uh, problem. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, and you talked about the solution of federal integral equations of second time, but there is uh, one question from the participants. Uh, please suggest some methods of solving Volterra integral equations of second time with non-linear problem. Yeah, there are, there are some some paper about that uh, Volterra equation, but uh, so, uh, we 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 didn't work on that Volterra equation. There are a lot of people from Portugal that uh, are uh, working on that subject, like uh, Pedro Lima, um, Teresa Diogo, and also uh, Vainico, and uh, from Estonia, and uh, also. Uh, uh, Pedas from Estonia too. Uh, one last question. Uh, could you give an example of non-linear Fredholm integral equations that solve with shorter basis? Uh, sorry? We, we uh, didn't uh, choose to solve uh, with this kind of basis. We hear in, uh, in our work uh, to uh, our numerical results uh, are uh, here to, um, to illustrate our theoretical results. And uh, we, uh, we use uh, uh, as, uh, as approximation, approximation space only uh, uh, piecewise polynomial spaces. And uh, we don't... Uh, we don't use other... Uh, or the uh, basis, but uh, you can use uh, Chebyshev polynomials. You can you can use uh, other things. Uh, there is no other questions uh, from the participants. Uh, so with this, we have come to the end of eleventh and last plenary talk of the third day international conference on fundamental and applied sciences. Uh, on behalf of Bhavan Sazariba Somani College of Arts and Science and Jairam Das Patel College of Manage, uh, Commerce and Management Studies, 
I, Sambika Sharma, Assistant Professor in the Department of Mathematics, thank all those who made the session a remarkable event. I express my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Lauren Graham for agreeing to be the resource person for this session. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, uh, you talked about the solution of Fredholm integral equations of the second kind and the methods uh, uh, for the better approximation and error estimation. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. You gave us new uh, approach to uh, explore uh, some new methods to find the solution. And we, ma'am, we, uh, uh, we really appreciate the ease with which you responded to our uh, emails. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, a, a conference cannot be successful without an engaged audience. So finally, I thank all the participants. Uh, we are truly overwhelmed with your active participation and look forward to a fruitful association in the future as well. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Over to you, Reena. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Sharma. Once again, a heartfelt thanks to all the eminent speakers of today's plenary session for a very enriching and enlightening experience. Now we break for lunch and gather again for the valedictory session at 2 p.m. sharp. The results for the paper and poster presentation shall be declared at the valedictory session. The feedback link will be sent after the valedictory session on both WhatsApp and Telegram group. Thank you all. See you soon at the valedictory session. Thank you.